people have joined us now. Yohan, what do you think? Yeah, we should probably get started uh, with this morning. Well, in Sweden, morning session. It's 9 a.m. here in Sweden. It's a lovely day, actually. Uh, autumn, of course. Um, my name is Juan Gunnarsson. I work in the international marketing and recruitment team here at Lund University. And today we are here to introduce um, the application process for people who are applying to bachelor's level programs at Lund University starting in the autumn of 2022. And of course, Maria has already said a few words to you as well. Would you like to say something else? Yes. Hello, everyone, and warm welcome to this webinar. My name is Maria Lindblad, and I also work here in the International Marketing Recruitment Team together with Johan. And uh, today is going to be a two-part session. So we're going to first show you a presentation, as you mentioned, about how to apply for bachelor studies. And then we're going to have a discussion with a panel of uh, representatives from for some of our uh, bachelor programs. So you will be able to ask any questions directly to them as well. Um, if you have any questions that come up throughout the presentation or questions that you want to ask the panelists, please use the Q&A for that, and we will uh, and get to your questions after the presentation. All right. And we should also say that this webinar is being recorded, so if you have any friends or anybody you know who is also interested in applying but who missed this or is unable to attend today, there will be a recording available after this presentation as well. All right, I think I will start to share uh, my screen here so we can get going with the presentation. So hopefully you can all see that properly. So right, as we already mentioned, we're going to go through the steps about applying to bachelor studies so that you all sort of have that foundation before we jump into the panel questions later on. So uh, this is the agenda. We're going to talk about uh, the bachelor's degree programs that we offer here at Lund University. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, application process, the tuition fees, uh, living costs, scholarships, and other funding options. And we're going to end with some top tips for a successful application. So first, jumping into the bachelor programs that we offer. So at Lund University, we have nine English taught bachelor's programs. Uh, for some of you, this might sound like a small number and actually in Sweden in general, most of the bachelor programs are only taught in Swedish. Um, so I think Lund University actually has the highest number of uh, English taught bachelor number, uh, sorry, bachelor programs, even though it's only nine. Uh, this is actually uh, quite a wide range compared to many of the other Swedish universities. You can see the nine programs listed here to the side, and some of these programs will be represented in the panel today. And we also have a second uh, presentation later this week where we have representatives from the other programs. So uh, you will be able to ask questions um, to the program staff from the program that you're interested in. Uh, our bachelor programs are three years in Sweden and they are course based so you study one or maximum two subjects at a time and then you finish the program with a thesis in the final semester. In many of these bachelor programs there are opportunities to study abroad or do an internship or have elective courses, usually that would be something that happens in the fifth semester or in some cases in the third semester as well. Um, so there is that a possibility for those of you who are interested in specializing or perhaps studying at another university um, during your bachelor studies as well. If you want to read more about these nine programs, you can find them on our webpage, uh, lunduniversity.lu.se forward slash programs. So um, jumping into the entry requirements now. So what does it take to be eligible to one of these bachelor programs? Well, there are a few different types of entry requirements that you need to be aware of. First, there are the general entry requirements, and that means that you must have successfully completed your upper secondary school or your high school studies. And actually, uh, we will need, we'll get to this a little bit later, but we will actually need your final, final high school documents or upper secondary documents by the application deadline. So if you are in the final semester, in the final year of your high school right now, 
you will not be able to apply in this application round that is open currently. We'll get to that in a moment. But I just want to mention that already because we do uh, see that a lot of students misunderstand this and apply while they're still in high school. Um, another general entry requirement is that you need to prove that you meet the required level of English. And this, uh, you can find the details about this on the national portal, application portal, universityadmissions.se. In addition to these general requirements, each program also has specific requirements. And what we mean by that is that depending on which program you choose, there will be specific subjects that you need to have studied in your high school or upper secondary school in order to be eligible. And these can be a little bit tricky for you to understand as an international applicant because they're based on the Swedish upper secondary school system. Uh, so if you do have any detailed questions, what does it mean that I need to have this level of mathematics or this level of chemistry? Uh, you can always reach out to us and we can uh, try to help explain that a little bit further because this is specific to each country depending on where you have studied before. And that is exactly um, what's mentioned here in terms of the third type of requirement, if you will, is the country specific requirement. So depending on where you studied your high school or upper secondary school, there will be different levels and different subjects that you can reach through those studies. And you might need to have taken an extra specialization or extra courses, or in some cases, even university level courses in order to meet the specific requirements. And you will find more about this on universityadmissions.se, which is the national application portal. Moving on to the English requirement, I mentioned that briefly when I talked about the general entry requirements. So just digging into that in a little bit more detail because we do get a lot of questions on that. So all applicants applying to any program at Lund University or any program in Sweden for that matter, do need to show that they meet the English language requirements. And for most programs, English six is the required level. Now, again, this can be hard to understand. What does it mean? What is English six? Uh, and on universityadmissions.se, you can find a whole page about the English requirements and all the ways in which you can prove that you meet this level. So there are several different ways you can prove it. Some students can show it through their upper secondary education. For example, if you did high school in the United States or in the UK or in any other English speaking country, sometimes your transcripts are just enough and that you don't need to submit anything else. You can just use your transcripts and they will prove that you meet the right English level. For some students, uh, on the other hand, they might have university studies, even though they're applying to a bachelor, they might already have a bachelor or some studies at a university. And in some cases they can use those documents to prove that they meet the English language requirement. And if none of these options are possible, or if you're not sure, it's always a good idea to take a test. There are several tests uh, that are approved and the most common one, of course, are TOEFL and IELTS. And on this page at universityadmissions.se, you'll find exactly what level of these tests you need and what score you need in order to reach English 6. So uh, jumping on to another question that we get a lot, um, and that is the question of the tuition fees. So we do get a lot of emails from prospective bachelor students asking, what does it cost to study in Sweden? What are the fees at your university? Um, and the first thing we want to say is that the fees are not specific to the university as such, they are specific to the program. So you actually have to check on the program webpage at the Lund University website to see exactly what the tuition is for your specific program. Um, and the tuition fees apply to all non-EU citizens, with some exceptions, but in general. Um, and you pay the tuition fee in installments, so you pay ahead of each semester. So the first installment is paid before you start your studies and the other uh, each semester during your studies. Now, uh, so I mentioned this briefly before, when should you apply? Um, and I said that some of you might not be able to apply in this round, but here are the general instructions. So the international application round, hopefully you all uh, are aware of this, is open right now. It opened in mid-October and the deadline to apply is the 17th of January. All the documents in this application round are due by the 1st of February. 
So this means that if you are applying to a bachelor program, we will need your upper secondary documents and final transcripts and diploma by the 1st of February. If you are able to provide this, if you have already finished and you have these documents, you can submit all of that and you will receive the admission results in April. We do have a national system in Sweden, so everybody gets the results on the same day. And the studies will start in late August or early September. And just to clarify one more thing, because we do also get students who say, but I'm an EU citizen or I'm a Swedish citizen, or can I, is there another round when I should apply? This is the round where everybody can apply. So in the international application round, it doesn't matter where you are living or uh, what your nationality is, you can always apply in this round to the international bachelor's programs. However, uh, it might be the case that you are still in your upper secondary school studies or in high school and you are not able to apply in this round simply because you cannot provide the documents. In that case, there is an option to also apply in the later round or the second round, sometimes also called the Swedish round, which is not really correct, but that's what, what it's called. Um, and that application round is open from mid-March to mid-April, 15th of March to 19th of April. And the documents in this round are due by the 21st of June. And if you are an IB applicant or some other categories of EU applicants, there is even a, a later deadline in July. And the admission results from this round will be announced in July. Now, we do not recommend that non-EU citizens apply in this round. And the reason for that is because, as I just mentioned, the results are only announced in July, around early or mid-July. So for those of you coming from outside of the EU, that does not leave a lot of time for you to, to find housing, to pay your tuition, to apply for a residence permit, which in itself can take several weeks. So that is why we uh, do not recommend that you apply in that round. If you wish to do so or take that chance, it's up to you, um, but um, it will be very tight. So just be aware of that. It might be better for you to wait until the next international application round instead. So now I've talked a lot about applying, but not actually mentioning how to apply. So we're gonna get into the steps now. So the first thing I want to say is that all applications are made through the national portal called universityadmissions.se. So this is for all students from around the world applying to uh, bachelors or, or masters for that matter. In Sweden, you go to this website universityadmissions.se to do your application. Step one when you get to this portal is that you create an account. Um, hopefully many of you have done that already. And you can only have one account, so don't start uh, applying to uh, creating several different accounts for different applications. You can do um, all applications and different application rounds in your same account. So just get one account. And make sure that you use an email address when you create the account that you're actually going to check because this is where you receive communication, both from university admissions and from us at Lund University. So make sure that you actually check uh, this account and that you use that email. The second step is to select your programs. And when you apply to bachelor programs, you can actually choose up to eight different programs in Sweden. Um, you can apply to almost all of the bachelor programs at Lund University if you want. Um, so uh, you can choose up to eight, but please be aware that uh, you can only be admitted to one program. So it's more that you are selecting your top choice program and then you have a backup in case you are not admitted to that program. But, um, but you can choose up, up to eight programs. And these can all be at Lund or they can be at different universities in Sweden. And it's up to you if you choose one or two or three or four or all the way up to eight. You have to do this uh, before the 17th of January. And of course, only apply to programs that you have verified that you are eligible for. So we talked earlier about the entry requirements. So make sure that you have checked all of this before you start your application. Once you have selected your programs, um, it is time to rank them in order. As I mentioned, you can only uh, be offered admission to one. That doesn't mean that you will get admission to eight and then you can choose one. It means you only get one. 
So you have to be very careful about the order in which you put your programs in your application. You can change the order up and down and around up until the 17th of January, but after that it is locked. So after that, you have to make sure that the program you listed as number one is the one that you're most hoping to be accepted into. If you're not accepted to that one or you're not eligible, then you have a chance um, to be offered admission to the second choice and so on. But it's very important to do this ranking and to carefully think through uh, which order you want to place your programs. And also the order affects other things as well, like uh, scholarships, for example, if you're interested in applying for that, uh, you need to be careful about uh, placing the program as your first choice. Okay. Uh, Johan, do you want to talk a little bit about the documents, perhaps? Sure, thank you, Maria. Um, Maria has uh, very helpfully explained how you go about making an application online, but that's kind of the first and probably the easiest part <laughs> of applying to a university in Sweden, because after you have selected your programs at the University of Admissions in Sweden website, you also have to complete your application uh, by uh, providing the correct supporting documents. And we're going to go through the documents that you need to provide. So first of all, if you're applying for bachelor's level studies at a university in Sweden, uh, you need a record of your completed upper secondary school education. And we have uh, told you about the deadline February the 1st. Now this February the 1st deadline is the deadline for all supporting documents and also um, payment of the application fee if you are a fee liable student. So your completed record of upper secondary education has to be in by then. And that means, as Maria has hinted and told you before, that if you are not due to finish your upper secondary school studies until maybe spring or summer 2022, this application round is not for you because you will not be able to prove that you have completed high school just yet. So you need also to provide proof of actually having graduated from high school in the form of a diploma or a degree certificate, depending on what country uh, you studied in before. You must provide proof of English language proficiency, um, English level six required for all programs. And also uh, you are advised to submit a copy of the page in your passport with your personal information so that we know that you are who you say you are and we can link your official documents with your um, ID basically. So we also have uh, country specific rules. And when I say we, I actually mean university admissions in Sweden, because they have set the rules and they also <laughs> make sure that students fulfill these rules before they uh, can be considered for admission. So there are different instructions depending on where you studied previously. And this is the kind of system you studied in, because these days we know it's quite common that perhaps a student can live in one country, but they go to some type of international high school or, and depending on the type of curriculum you would have there, you need to follow the country specific rules for that um, system. So uh, most students, they, let's say I'm a German student, I study in Germany in German high school, then I go to the Germany page. But if I, uh, studied in Germany in an uh, international school, perhaps it was a US type high school or even British, then you need to follow the rules for those countries. Um, they will have specific instructions for eligibility to make sure that you fulfill the entry requirements and also what documents you need to prepare and how they should be delivered to university admissions in Sweden. And those rules must be followed completely. Uh, in order for us to be able to consider your application. So please do go to the University of Admissions in Sweden.se website and check the country specific instructions for the country where you previously studied. For most of our uh, bachelor's programs, there are no program specific documents or so your academic record, that would be enough. Uh, but some programs, uh, other programs that are not actually represented here today, such as fine art and music, they have their own procedure for admitting students. So if you're interested in one of those programs, you need to find out how to go about making your application. But for the most of our programs, you only need to provide your upper secondary school merits in order to be able to participate in the selection if you're eligible. Now, February 1st is also the deadline for certain students who are fee liable to pay the application fee or 
for your EU students, EU, EEA, I should say, to prove that they are fee exempt. So if you're non-EU or non-EEA citizen, you're fee liable, you need to pay the application fee to university admissions in Sweden no later than February the 1st. Now, of course, we never recommend that you wait until the very last minute to do so. Um, please do it as early as possible, because then, you know, university admissions in Sweden, they may start assessing your application and see if there are any problems. And if there are problems with your application, they will notify you. And if it's before the February 1st deadline, there may still be time for you to correct any mistakes or problems with your application. The application fee is 900 Swedish krona, which is around 90 euros or 100 US dollars. And uh, regardless if you decide to apply for one or eight different programs, it's the same flat fee. Again, it's paid to university admissions in Sweden and not to Lund University. Um, so you must pay this or prove that you're fee exempt by February the 1st in order to have your uh, application processed and be able to participate in the selection to our programs. If you are from the EU, your EU EEA citizen, there is no application fee, but you must prove that you are fee exempt uh, as well before February the 1st. So this is most commonly done by uh, uploading a, a passport page, uh, your personal information page in the passport to show that you are indeed um, a citizen of uh, an EU country. So that is what we recommend that you do as soon as possible, as well as your other supporting documents, of course. So after you have made your application online and provided your academic documents and proof of English and pay the application fee or prove that you're fee exempt, your application will be assessed by university admissions in Sweden. So they, that's basically what they do uh, on our behalf. They check so that all merits are, have been handed in in the correct way. Uh, you have your, your upper secondary school merits will be registered, proof of English language proficiency, et cetera. Um, and they will check so that you meet the general requirements for bachelor level studies in Sweden and that you fulfill the program specific requirements uh, for certain subjects that are important for the programs um, that you're applying to. Uh, so the programs in Lund will actually not check every application to see if any requ requirements are filled. This is actually handled at the national level. So, and this is a bit curious, perhaps, for many students, they want to know if everything is, is okay with their application. Unfortunately, university admissions in Sweden will not notify students in case everything looks okay. Uh, it is the student's responsibility that all uh, documents are handed in the correct way and that you do everything before the various deadlines that we have described here. Actually, no news is good news, you might say, because uh, university admissions in Sweden will uh, typically only notify students if they find problems. So if they do not find problems, everything should hopefully be okay. Uh, if they do find a problem that maybe some documents have not been provided in the correct way or there are documents missing from your application that are essential, they will leave a message for you on your university admissions in Sweden account. And I do believe that when they uh, create a message for you in your account, there is should be some type of email notification coming to you as well, saying that something has happened, log into your account at university admissions in Sweden and check the information there. Um, so if you have made a mistake or there is a problem with your documents and university admissions in Sweden will not approve it as it is, uh, any such mistake must be corrected before the document deadline, which is February the 1st. So that is why we typically recommend that students make an application early and hand in their supporting documents and pay the application fee as soon as possible, because then that will um, there will be a higher chance that you will get uh, feedback on your application if there are mistakes. Please check your application account on University Admissions in Sweden and the associated email address, of course, uh, to see if there are any messages waiting uh, for you there. Uh, at least once per week, uh, I would say, uh, even check your spam folder uh, because some emails from University Admissions in Sweden and also from us, if we want to contact you for a reason, uh, they may end up in your spam folder. So please check that regularly as well. 
So a student who fulfills both the gen so-called general entry requirements for studies at university in Sweden and also the program specific requirements may be uh, considered for a selection. You can participate in the selection. Um, for the international bachelor's degree programs we offer here at Lund University, uh, the selection is based completely on upper secondary school GPA. So the grade point average of your upper secondary school studies, that is what uh, we look at to see if we want to select you or not. As we said earlier, there are no extra documents that you can send in or that we require, no personal letter, no recommendation letter, no CV, nothing like that. So it's just about your upper secondary school grades. All right, so the admission results for Bachelor's applicants, you have to wait uh, one week longer than the master's students. On April 13, 2022 is when the admission results are announced and they are announced on your University Admissions in Sweden account. So on that day, I, I think it usually happens in the morning or before noon, um, Central European time. You can log into your account and you can find out if you have been selected for admission or possibly placed on the list of reserves or if your application was projected for some reason. After that, of course, there's plenty of information that we will want to, to give you, and we will have many webinars and information sessions arranged in the spring to tell students about the upcoming steps after they have received their admission result, because there are so many things you have to do. You have to apply for a residence permit, you have to pay the application fee, uh, sorry, tuition fee if you're fee liable. You have to apply for housing, you have to plan to come to learn, to book your trip, etc. So there are so many things that we need to discuss with you at that point in time. But you're going to have to wait until April 2022 to uh, get that type of information from us. Now we're going to talk a little bit about living cost scholarships and other funding opportunities for international students. So many people want to know how much should I budget for uh, if I want to come to Sweden and join your university, how much money will I need? Now, we recommend around 9000 Swedish krona per month. So that is around 900 euros to cover all your necessary expenses, monthly expenses, including accommodation, food, course literature, local transportation, uh, mobile phone bill, leisure activities, etc. So 900 euros per month is a realistic student budget, I would say, both for local and international students. I think you need to plan for cooking most of your own meals, because I do think that if there is one thing that is slightly more expensive in Sweden than some other countries in, say, continental Europe, it is restaurants. Restaurant visits can be rather expensive here. So in order to save money, and most students want to save money, um, you need to cook most of your own meals, basically. And this is completely normal. And that is something that local and international students alike do uh, most of the time. Of course, you can choose to go to a cafeteria, cafe or restaurant once in a while, but maybe not three times per day. Um, for non-EU EEA citizens, uh, it's essential that you have a certain amount of money uh, in your personal bank account in order to get your residence permit application approved. Um, currently, you will need around one, uh, sorry, 850 euros, around 8,500 Swedish krona per month of studies in Sweden in order to get your residence permit application approved. So around 8,500 euros per uh, academic year, basically. But the good news is there are scholarships for non-EU EEA students. So if you are a citizen of a non-EU EEA country, you may apply for, uh, for example, the Lund University Global Scholarship, which is our own local scholarship program. So all non-EU free liable students are eligible to apply for this. And this is a program that can offer partial uh, tuition fee waivers, basically. So uh, depending on what you apply for, uh, you can get maybe 25 to even 90% of the tuition fee waived if you are selected for this uh, scholarship. Again, um, we cannot uh, provide you with living expenses. So the funds you need to, for your living expenses, you have to provide yourself. 
Um, the Lund University Global Scholarship is merit-based. It's a merit-based scholarship. It's not a needs-based scholarship, and it's very selective. So only a few lucky students per program and year can actually get this scholarship. Uh, but now is not the time to apply for a scholarship. You're going to have to wait uh, because uh, we do not open the application system for the Lund University Global Scholarship until early February. We do not have an exact date yet, but I do believe a couple of days after the deadline to submit your supporting documents and pay the application fee. So a few days after February the 1st, basically, is usually when we open up. And eligible students will all get invitations to make an application to the Lund University Global Scholarship. You're gonna to need to provide some personal details and also a motivate, upload motivation letter, basically. It's quite simple. So that is a one funding option for certain students, uh, but you must have, of course, a realistic plan because if you're applying for a bachelor's program here in Sweden, you will likely stay here for at least three years to complete the program. Um, so you must have a realistic funding plan for these three years, at least three years, I should say, because many students want to extend their stay uh, beyond the three years. And uh, that's possible if you're a non-EU EA student or EU student. Um, you should look for funding opportunities in your home country. You may be eligible to receive a bank loan or some kind of grant from your home country. Uh, so it's time right now to start looking for different options, depending on the situation in your home country. Um, but you need to have a realistic plan for how to fund your stay here in Sweden, because not all students will or can get a scholarship from Lund. All right, we're actually nearing the end of this PPT, the presentation. We have collected some of our you know, uh, tips top application tips for studies here. First of all, and this is super important and it applies to all students, regardless where they come from, make sure that you meet all the entry requirements before you make an application. Um, I would say the two most common reasons for rejection uh, here, if you apply to Sweden is A, you don't meet the entry requirements and B, you have not uh, submitted your uh, supporting documents in the correct way. So these two things are key. So please check, the country specific information pages on the University Admissions in Sweden website uh, to see exactly how you can prove your eligibility based on where you studied before and also what documents you need to send in and how to submit them. Make sure that you have an accepted proof of English language proficiency. Um, if you find out that you need to take an English language test such as IELTS or TOEFL uh, to prove your English language proficiency, it's high time to book. Um, a test time because usually you can't do this immediately and also it takes a little while to get the actual result and this must be provided by the February 1st deadline in order for us to consider you for uh, admission. Now with regard to your actual application to learn uh, you can choose and rank your programs in the order you want uh, up until 17th of January. So after that date your, your application is locked and it's no longer possible to add programs or change the way you have ranked them in your application. Also, please pay the application fee or prove that you're exempt early on so that you have a chance to get timely feedback from university admissions in Sweden about your application in case there are any issues. Also, of course, we have mentioned this, uh, your official documents from your upper secondary school education, um, these should be uh, gathered and submitted as early as possible. If you have them already, please provide them in the way uh, described by University Admissions in Sweden, upload them to your account most of the time, depending on where you come from. You have to check the country specific requirements here and information. Uh, everything has to be in by the 1st of February, no later than that. So if you have supporting documents that you know already you cannot provide before the 1st of February, then we probably would have to advise you to postpone your application because you cannot participate in the selection unless your application is complete by February the 1st. So the deadlines are strict. We have two deadlines. I know that can be a little bit confusing. January 17th for, to make the application online and February the 1st for all the documents and the application fee or 
proof of fee exemption. But these two deadlines are strict. And after we have passed these deadlines, there is actually nothing we can do to help you with your application. So this is very important. And the last piece of uh, advice we have for you is that you must check your University Admissions in Sweden account and your associated email address regularly, because this is the only way that University Admissions in Sweden and also us, the Lund University, that we can communicate you throughout the uh, application process in case we have important information to share or advice about your application. So please do check these two things carefully throughout the application procedure. We would also like to take this opportunity to tell you that we have many very, very talented and friendly students who are currently uh, working for us uh, to represent their programs and th themselves, of course, as students here at Lund University. Um, and it's possible to chat with them. So if you visit our website, lunduniversity.lu.se slash chat hyphen current hyphen students, you will be able to uh, find current students at Lund University who are happy to answer your questions about life and learn as a student, basically. So please take the opportunity to chat with people. Maybe there are people from your country or in a program that you're interested in. So uh, please do contact them. You may also contact us, me or one of my colleagues in the international marketing and recruitment team easily by going to our website, lunduniversity.lu.se slash degree hyphen studies um, and fill out a form and contact us and we will do our best to help you with your application. Uh, there's a lot of information we know that students need to, to digest uh, in order to make a successful application. And if you have problems understanding some part of the application process or a program here at Lund University, you're more than welcome to contact us and we'll try our best to help you. All right, that's it. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Johan. Okay, I will uh, finish sharing my screen here so we can get back to the rest of this session today. So uh, we have a couple of questions that have come in uh, during our presentation. And I just glanced at them quickly here, but I believe they were quite general questions. So I think Johan and I, can address those before we uh, come back to our panel, uh, which of course is the other half of this webinar today, where we will be asking uh, your questions to the, the panelists that we have with us today from the different programs and different bachelor programs that are represented. Uh, but like I said, before we uh, have the panelists back to introduce themselves, we will uh, address a couple of these uh, general questions that have come in throughout our presentation. We have a student here um, from India who is asking about the bachelor's documents. And if we, we had mentioned in the presentation that you need to submit all the transcripts uh, and they are wondering exactly what we mean with all the transcripts, if it's only the, the final term or the full term. And, um, Generally, we would have to understand the specific documents, of course, for, for your country and so on. But in general, when we say all documents, we do mean all documents, not just your, your final, uh, your final uh, transcript and your diploma. Uh, many students, unfortunately, make this mistake that they just submit proof that they have finished. Uh, their high school, but we actually also need to see the transcripts throughout the years. So we do need the, uh, the official transcripts for each year in high school um, so that they can check your grades throughout, uh, throughout the high school studies. I hope that answered your question. Otherwise you can send us a message after and we can look in more detail in your case. So that's that. Johan, do you wanna? Yeah, I also just want to add to, to Maria's answer, uh, which was already comprehensive enough, but there is sometimes we do encounter students who for various reasons have a maybe a missing semester from their transcript or something like that. Um, and that is usually not accepted by university admissions in Sweden. So all your completed upper secondary school education, all semesters, all years must be somehow accounted for. So this is important to know. Um, we have a, another question by 10 person. Can we apply to as many scholarships as we want 
or do we need to apply to only one? If we are allowed to apply to many scholarships, what are the chances of getting more than one scholarship? <laughs> well, it's very hard for us to estimate anyone's chance to get a scholarship before they actually make an application. Most scholarships programs are selective, of course, so it's always going to be competitive to actually secure a scholarship. But on the other hand, if you don't apply to the scholarship, you're never going to know if you will be selected or not. But uh, the first part of your question, can you apply to as many scholarships as you want? Well, yes, uh, you can. Uh, Lund University Global Scholarship is the one that we have here locally, uh, but there are also others maybe in your home country or some other international scholarship uh, funding body that you can apply to and you may apply to all of them if you want to. Right, and uh, finally we have another general question here about when to apply and uh, the student is asking, I'm going to apply in the second round, should I register now or should I wait? Um, so, of course, you can create your university admissions account uh, so that you have everything uh, set up already. Uh, however, you have to make the actual application, selecting the programs and so forth within that specific round that you're applying in. Uh, your account is still there and uh, your account will be there even if you upload documents, they will be there in your account. But you need to select the programs and rank the programs and pay the application fee if applicable uh, for the round where you are actually applying. So you can't complete all the steps now if you're applying in the later round, but you can certainly set up your account and even provide documents if you want to do that. All right. Um, there was also, I should also say, there was one person raising their hand throughout the webinar, but we will not be able to take uh, questions verbally. So if you still have a question, please feel free to write it here in the Q&A as well. Okay, I have one more here, Johan, uh, one more general question. Right. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm from Croatia. And right now I am in high school. I'm in my last year. I will finish high school in May and I will have my final exams in June. So does this mean that I cannot apply for this year because of the documents that are required due February the 1st? Well, uh, Vic, uh, you are from Croatia and I uh, will assume that you're an EU citizen then. So you may actually use the so-called second application round or second admission round, which is open between March 15 to April 15, in order to have a chance to submit your complete uh, record of upper secondary school education in, do you remember the date, Maria? It's sometime in June, isn't it? Or is it even early yeah, 21st July? 21st of June, 21st of June. 21st of June. So as long as you can provide a complete record of your upper secondary school education, and obviously also proof of English language proficiency, at that point, you should, should be able to participate in the selection. But in the currently open application round, which closes on uh, January 17, um, you, uh, you are still not eligible. So you're gonna have to wait for the second admission round. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one final, I think, general question here before we jump into um, our panel discussions. Um, so here's a student from Nigeria who finished uh, the secondary school 16 years ago and is asking if that is a problem. Uh, in general, no, uh, we look at your eligibility and your grades and not when the, uh, the grades are from. Uh, when you apply to a bachelor, so it's actually quite common that some people uh, go on and, and decide later on in life that they want to get an, an academic degree um, and have previously only finished uh, high school, so you are certainly welcome to apply. The thing you might have to check a little bit extra is when it comes to the eligibility requirements, if the education system has, has changed, uh, there might be other requirements in order for you to meet the program specific uh, requirements. Um, for example, if a program requires a certain level of mathematics, it might be that um, in the later years you can reach this through the high school documents, but if you studied many years ago, it might have been a different system. So you might have to look into the specific details of eligibility, but it's no problem to apply uh, even several years after you finished high school. Okay, we keep getting some general questions here, Johan, but I think maybe we should mix it up a little bit and, and start with our um, talking to our panelists and then we can come back perhaps and see if we can uh, jump back into some general questions as well. Um, let me see here. Um, all right. 
I will just quickly answer this one. I think uh, there's a student here asking, uh, I'm having my, I will have my secondary final exam results translated, but I've also taken the SATs. Can I apply with both of these? Well, uh, we actually do not consider SATs. Um, we have a different similar um, national aptitude test in Sweden, but for international applicants, of course, they, they normally don't take this test as it is a Swedish test in Sweden. Um, so you would only apply with your, uh, with your high school grades. So try to get these translated so that they are finished in time for the 1st of February deadline. Okay, should we go ahead and introduce, let the panelists introduce themselves, Johan. Yes, um, now I can invite uh, the panelists to introduce themselves in the order that you appear on my screen. <laughs> I'm not sure it's the same order on your screen, but I'm gonna actually start with Anna-Maria Persson from Mathematics. Would you please introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Johan. Um, so my name is Anna-Maria Persson and I am um, a lecturer, so, um, Associate Professor in Mathematics at the Department of Mathematics at the Faculty of Science. And I am the study director for the bachelor's um, program in mathematics and also for the master's program in mathematics at our department. All right, thank you, Anna Maria. If we have anyone here uh, among the participants who's interested in mathematics, please direct your question to Anna Maria. Next up on my screen is Ulrich Mortensen. Hi, my name is uh, Ulrich Martensson and I'm a director of studies for the Department of Physical Geography and Ecosystem Sciences. So I'm partly working with the administration, but in parallel, of course, I'm also a lecturer and uh, I've been teaching here for a very long time. And I'm quite happy to see that we have uh, participants here from uh, very uh, different countries all over the world. Some of them, I've worked in Nigeria, for instance, I worked in Sri Lanka, and so on. I have a very international background and a very international career within the field of physical geography and natural resource management to the climate change and that kind of stuff. Thank you. Mm, excellent. So if, if there's anyone who's interested in physical geography and ecosystem science, please direct your question to Ulrich. And uh, next on my screen is Magnus Hilman from Biomedicine. Yes, thanks, John. Uh, Magnus here. I'm an um, uh, associate professor and, uh, and also a lecturer in biomedicine. Um, we have two programs. I'm here to, to talk about the bachelor program with you guys. Uh, I'm also a research scientist. So I have my uh, research lab and I focus on type 1 diabetes and the onset. I'm an immunologist in my professions. So, so uh, all of the teachers basically of the biomedical program are also active research scientists that you can interact with on a daily basis. And we think that is really important to emphasize as well. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Magnus. And you said, you mentioned that you uh, you work with, you two, with two programs. And I think it's maybe it's important to uh, tell our participants that all representatives here today, mathematics, physical geography, biomedicine, and also physics that we will introduce soon, will ha also have corresponding master's programs that you can you can uh, potentially join after you finish a bachelor here. Um, the last panelist on my list, uh, Hanno Pere from physics. Yeah, thanks, Johan. Hi, um, I'm assistant director of studies for the, for the department of physics, and I'm also a teacher in various courses. And of course, also a researcher. So um, most of our teachers are researchers in physics. Um, I'm specializing in the detection of neutrons, so I'm part of the nuclear physics um, division. And uh, this is a lot of research going towards the European Spallation Source, which is being built in Lund, which makes Lund quite unique in that, in that way. Um, yeah, maybe I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Thank you, Hanno. Uh, we have a question. I think Maria is answer, uh, answering it. Uh, she's typing. typing. Answer, yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I would like to know because I'm quite curious, and we get this question uh, quite often. Uh, and that is, if students would like to know or kind of estimate their chances of being offered admission <laughs> before they make an application. Um, and of course, in order to kind of estimate that, it's helpful to know how many students you typically admit uh, in every international application round. So starting with Anna Maria, do you have an idea about how many students you typically admit per year to the bachelor? 
it's in the international admission round it's about 30. it's um, about 30. maybe from the uh, 30 admitted 25 uh, finally can uh, appear so um start their the program hmm. of course we offer um we can admit uh, the first placed on on the reserve list but uh, for some students coming from um non-eu countries it's it's hard to get the uh um the residence permit in time to to actually be able to start a program so it's we we our numbers are set to 30 um students in the international round and uh, equally many in the national round okay so potentially 50 to 60 students may yeah. actually start yes okay uh, ulrich what about fiscal geography how many do you aim to admit uh, in the international application round we normally uh, uh, admit a little bit less than uh, uh, mathematics but say about 20 students in the international round and 20 students in the national application round so we aim to have uh, between 30 and 40 students when the semester starts but we are also facing, as Anna Maria said, we have the same problems, particularly with the international students, that there is uh, uh, quite a high percentage of no show due to different practical reasons, for instance, getting uh, the uh, residence permit on, on time. Hmm. We try to help out as much as possible. And I know that uh, Lund University, we have uh, good relations with the Swedish immigration. Uh, we even, well, you at the uh, external relations, you have a special officer that is responsible for contacts with the uh, Swedish Immigration Authority. And I think uh, in most cases, uh, we make it on time, but there could be implication, not least now during the corona that has created a lot of problems. If you are from... Uh, Bangladesh, you have to go to India because it's only the embassy in India that issue residence permits. So it could be a bit tricky for some people. Yeah, it's always a good idea to when students know for sure that they want to come and they can come that they apply for a residence permit. So this is not delayed uh, because it, it's it's sort of out of our control or out of our direct control because this is between the student and the Swedish migration agency, of course. Um, what about you, Magnus? Uh, I, just to give some context and background, your program in biomedicine was a couple of years ago offered in Swedish, but now you have switched to English, making it possible for many more students uh, from all over the world to actually join. Uh, are you still admitting the same number of students? Well, actually, it's not, it's not only taught in English, but we made an international program, which mm. is much more, I mean, it's a whole different thing. So we, we designed uh, th this new program and we started the admission last year in 2020. So this is only the second year uh, that we have actually um, executed the program in an international environment. Uh, with a lot of international teachers and students and uh, with, with the global health kind of perspective as well. We have we offer uh, 50 spots on the program and uh, last year we had um, or this year we had uh, a little bit more than 1500 applicants for those. So, so from both the uh, rounds of application. Mm. So uh, there is a mix. We are mostly Swedish students, but uh, almost like 30% or so come from from uh, all the continents in the world. So that's pretty nice environment to study in, I would say. Mm, excellent. Uh, Hanno, what about the physics department and the physics program? Yeah, we have uh, two programs. So one is in Swedish and one is in English. Um, the, uh, we have around 90 students in total and all of which are 30 internationals. Um, however, it, the way it works is that if you are an international student, you will start with, with the math courses and then you'll start with the basic physics courses. The Swedish program is doing it the other way around. And then after the first year, basically both are being merged and the rest of the education is in English. So you will study with, with the Swedish students as well eventually. It is basically just the first year, which uh, is kind of flipped in a sense. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you, Hanu. Great, yeah. 
Uh, well, we don't have any any questions at the moment, but I want to remind all the participants that uh, please uh, ask the panelists. This is your chance to ask any questions that are specific about the bachelors that you're interested in. Uh, and in order to warm up for that, I think we would like to ask the panelists uh, why you think that a student who is interested in, in the subject area that you represent, why should they apply to your specific program? Let's start with Ulrich. Well, they, there could be um, many different reasons. One reason could be that our department is ranked very high on the world ranking. We are number 24 on the QS ranking for 2021. So we are one of the very top uh, departments in physical geography and ecosystem sciences. But then we have a very international environment. Uh, roughly half of our students and more than half of the staff, they're coming from uh, different countries all over the world, from all, uh, all continents uh, also. So we have uh, teaching staff from, from uh, uh, over 30 different nationalities. So you, you will enter into a very international environment. The uh, uh, prospect for getting uh, um, a job is very good. And we also offer uh, five different master's programs. So you can specialize in different directions after you have finished the uh, the uh, bachelor uh, degree, if you don't want to move to another university around in the world. And uh, Lund is a very nice city as well for being a student in. It's very friendly. It's a small town. You travel basically on foot or by bicycle. You reach uh, all the departments and all the important points within 10, 15 minutes from wherever you are staying in the city. So I feel that we are, we are well off from many different, both academic and social uh, perspectives. Great, thank you. Many, many good reasons there from Ulrich. What about Hanno? Why should a student who is interested in physics uh, opt for your physics program? Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, I mean, uh, I think uh, Ulrich wrote already a very good case for Lund in general, and uh, that of course applies for physics as well. Um, I think it's uh, what makes us maybe a little bit stick out is that we have uh, a lot of very, very good research going on. It's, it's very broad, so there's a lot of different fields that you can that you can basically enter. So if you're interested in physics, you can do anything from particle physics to you know orders of magnitude larger nanophysics to cosmology. Or um, so there's a very broad a research field that you can enter later on. And what makes uh, us also special is that we have very good connections to a, a lot of very large scale facilities. So for example, CERN, which is mostly particle physics, um, but also like the facilities I mentioned before that are being being built or have been built in Lund. So that is, one is called Max Führer, it's a synchrotron um, facility. So it's being used, so basically X-ray uh, energies are being used to um, investigate all kinds of, of matter. Uh, and the um, ESS, the European Spallation Source, it, which is striving to be the world's brightest neutron source, is being currently constructed in Lund, which is quite exciting. And they're basically, again, by bike ride away from the university. And we have very close co um, collaboration with these facilities. So that is, that is a very exciting environment to get into. They're just starting up. They, they're hiring a lot of people. Um, and it's a very dynamic environment, very international as well. Um, so I think there is a lot of interesting potential from that side, for example, which may, which is uh, quite unique, and it's quite like I said. Also, it's a it's just a very interesting time to get into just these fields. Wow, very interesting uh, from Hanna there as well. Uh, Magnus, why should you opt for biomedicine at Lund? Well, uh, as I said before, it's uh, I mean, as a student, that's uh, already at the bachelor level, you are able to be part of the frontiers in, in biomedical research because you will be able to, to, to do projects on research labs and, and uh, uh, it, it's not like just having lectures and discussions but also actually doing real biomedical research it's a huge part of our philosophy that you should actually do that as a student. Uh, we use a lot of uh, team-based learning 
at uh, the program. Uh, we were the first program in, in Lund. I think we are the only program in, in Sweden, actually, but I know that a lot of international students have had team-based learning experience from their uh, home countries. And um, I would say that we are quite progressive in that. So that means that you students need to really prepare, come prepared, uh, participate in discussions uh, with the frontiers in biomedical research. And if you like that, if you are really that interested in solving problems related to the pandemic and how we can figure things out for upcoming pandemics, because this was probably not the, the last one we experienced, uh, you can actually be part of solving those problems in the future. And we will give you the good opportunities to, to really prepare for that. And, and also, I totally agree with Ulrich and, uh, and Hando. Lund is a, it's a, it's a beautiful university city, really amazing, actually. It's uh, one of the top university cities in, in Sweden, without doubt. Great, yeah, very, very relevant topic these days, for sure. And uh, finally, Anna Maria. Yeah, so in addition to what my colleague said already about Lund being a wonderful uh, campus and um, the university, one of the best, um, our program is actually just one specialization uh, within um, the bachelor's program in science offered by the Faculty of Science. So there's a lot of flexibility there in combining mathematics with other subject areas. And um, as a bachelor's student in maths, you are um, also supposed to take one uh, semester in another uh, subject. So in, in, for instance, in, in physics or in physical geography, you can, you can study that. And um, there is a lot of inbuilt flexibility within the program. So you can kind of create your own profile um, as a student. And I think it's, it's one of the features that um, kind of singles our program out. So if you're interested in mathematics, you have the chance to, to kind of dive deep into that. Uh, we offer a variety of courses in maths, um, mathematical statistics and numerical analysis. And uh, you are kind of free to, to, to tailor your specialization and also combine with other subjects of interest. So you can study Swedish as well. If, you're, if you want to go outside science areas, you can combine maths with economics. You can opt for statistics and finance, for instance. So uh, there, there are lots of choices. I, I think that's very interesting uh, what you're describing, Anna Maria, with the, what you can do inside the program as a student to tailor the to the program to your to suit your own interests and, and what you want to do. And maybe sometimes for some students, they only discover this after they come here that they oh I'm interested in this I want to try that. So there are a lot of opportunities to 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 tailor the program to your needs. Uh, Magnus, is it the same in biomedicine? Are there do you have a lot of elective courses that students can choose, or is it very, uh, you know, locked? Is the is the curriculum locked? Uh, no, we had uh, we have actually a lot of partner universities um, outside in Europe and, and uh, US um, that you can actually travel abroad. Uh, as a student, uh, when it comes to staying in Sweden there uh, or at Lund University, um, I mean there are certain courses that you need to take. Uh, and and when we uh, send students to other universities, we try to figure out so yet that you get pretty much the same uh, kind of content. Uh, because at the bachelor program, uh, it, it's definitely more locked than, for example, the master's program where you can. Uh, choose. So now uh, more luck than what Anna Maria was uh, describing for her program. Mm. So what about you, Hanno, in physics? Is there a lot of, are there a lot of opportunities for students to select courses that they, we have a lot of courses in physics, uh, but are they free to choose? Uh, and at what point can they choose? Yeah, so that comes a little bit later in the program. So the beginning is basically really just to create the foundation that you will build upon. So the, the, the courses do follow a certain progression that you that you have to keep up with. So at the beginning, you have math and, and basic uh, basic physics, and then you, you, you add quantum mechanics and so on to it. And later you, you do atomic physics, nuclear physics, and so forth. But later on, there are elective courses where you basically can pick anything that is offered at the um, Faculty of Science. Um, 
and um, yeah, so there, there is, there's certain flexibility and there's even a, a time slot in the fifth semester where you can, uh, you could travel internationally. Um, so like I said, you have to make sure that you, you, you get a certain co uh, content, of course, but uh, in general, there is a flexibility. Ulrich, is it the same at the fiscal geography department? Yes, uh, actually, uh, the bachelor program, as Anna Maria said, it's it, we have one bachelor program in science, and under that we have orientations, which contains all the 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 different uh, departments bachelor program, and I think that's uh, that's a, is an important point that for all the bachelor programs you have basically a major, but then you have to look for a minor or for something outside your main topic. So if you study mathematics, it's compulsory to have one semester outside. Physical geography and ecosystem science the same. And of course, we recommend our students to use that as a semester for study abroad. Uh, but if you don't want to travel outside, you, you have, as have been said already, you have plenty of courses from the others science uh, departments uh, to go look for or you can move just uh, inside sweden so you, you choose to study at another swedish university but one semester is you have to do something else in order to broaden your your field of interest and uh, and your competences okay great uh, we got a question here uh, a little bit earlier. We were talking about the number of seats on the respective programs, and now we got a question related uh, related to how many applicants there are, because of course people want to try to assess their their chances of getting admission. And, and this, uh, as we mentioned before during the presentation, this can be a little bit hard, perhaps, for the panelists to give you an exact number on, because the admission is happening at a national level, and as Johan mentioned earlier. Um, most applicants, I would almost say, at least a very large part of the applicants are usually not eligible because they might be applying in the wrong round before they finish their studies or they might not be submitting the right documents or meet the requirements of the program. So in many cases, students are kind of um, filtered out of the process in a quite early stage. And then the, the specific programs will only see the eligible and uh, selected students. But I want to throw the question out there anyway, if uh, there are any of the panelists who have an idea of how competitive the program is and how many uh, applicants you usually have to your programs. Anna Maria, so you had your hand up, so maybe you want to start. <laughs> Yeah, I can actually give you the uh, uh, the numbers for the last year application round. Um, so in the international round, we had 274 applicants and 25 got admitting, admitted. And in the national round, it was 222 and also 25 uh, got admitted and registered. So um, slightly more were admitted i think it was around 30 but 50 students actually started the program in uh, uh last last autumn and i i think almost i have the numbers for natural geography and ecosystem science as well it, i mean i have them in my, on my screen if, if ulrich um, permits so i think there were 224 in the international round and 130 in the national round can that be correct, Ulrich? No, it sounds very, very correct. I will let's, let's go. I can find physics as well. Um, in 341 in the international round, 20 got admitted, and 127 in the national round, and 18 got admitted. So since we have this uh, joint program, I, we can access the, the ap application numbers and yeah, admission admission numbers for the, for the different programs. I cannot um, say anything about the biomedicine. Yeah, Magnus, do you have any idea for your program? Yeah, well, I, I mentioned it previously when I uh, presented the number. We had approximately 1,500 applicants for the second year, and it was uh, quite an increase from 2020 and we expect it to increase the first years because it's a new this program 
So uh, among these 1,500, we have 476 that search for uh, biomedicine in, as priority one. Um, and that is also something that counts in, in which order you, you apply for, for different programs. So uh, 1,500 in total, but uh, 476 in first priority. So remember to rank your programs, as we said in the presentation, it's very important to have the best chance for, for admission because it is quite competitive. Um, but that begs the question then to the panelists here, uh, what are you looking for? We know that you are not doing a selection as, as such, it's happening more at a national level, but if you could pick and choose <laughs> what, uh, what it would be the perfect student, what kind of students are you looking for? in your programs. Um, yeah, do you want to start, Hanna? Sure. Um, yeah, so we, we, I mean, we have different kind of tracks as well and um, that you can enter according to interest. And I think physics is a, is a, is, is rather broad. Um, so um, um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit hard to say now for the bachelor program as we're not really involved in, in the, in the um, decision process there. I think um, I can say more for the master. Um, so I think um, our, our, our courses have a lot of, um, of labs, for example, where you, you gain practical experience. So I think this kind of interest that you're interested in both understanding the theoretical aspects of things, but you have also interest in, in, in practically, um, you know, testing, uh, testing these hypotheses and, 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 and studying uh, and discussing experimental results. Um, so I think all that is, is quite a big part of the of the education. And of course, you can then specialize in theoretical topics or more applied topics, or there's various kind of, um, yeah, there's fundamental research, there is an, there is more applied fields and so on and so on. So I think you, you later on specialize, but in the beginning, you, you do have this very broad base. So I think you, you need to have some kind of interest in, in, in digging into a lot of different things. Um, and, and yeah, before before going a little bit more in, in depth in, in, a, in a specific topic that 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 you find fascinating. Great, uh, Ulrich. What what do you say? What's the ideal student for your program? I agree with Hanno here that uh, I mean a, a keen interest in uh, processes in the environment around us and uh, and uh, quite a, a, a broad mind and and being prepared to, to look at these problems from different uh, aspects. So we are teaching about climate change, we are teaching about uh, processes shaping the surface of the earth, and we are digging in a little bit into geology uh, stuff. And, and we also have a lot of, um, as Hannah said, uh, methodological uh, courses where we provide the students with uh, good tools to measure the intensity of the processes and then as we are part of geography topic of course the map is a big uh, part of our our uh, toolbox and today it's uh, geographical information system so we are using uh, the map in in computers and we are using uh, satellite imageries and uh, area photographs in order to to map different features on the surface so a broader and general interest for for the well-being of the planet would be maybe a catchy thing to say here <laughs> sounds great uh, magnus yeah well um <clears throat> if you're interested or if you come to learn to get taught biomedicine then biomedicine is probably probably not the program for you but if you if you have to, to learn then we can definitely help you with that and there is a huge difference be, uh, between the two because um, I, I know that a lot of students have this experience where the lecturer or the teacher is telling you facts that you will remember and, and to replicate uh, during an exam uh, that is not how it works on, on the biomedical program you need to prepare, you need to work hard, and you need to not only spend time on the library, but also in the research laboratories to actually apply the knowledge that you get. And that is how we work, and that is how we will continue to work. And our students are really, we can definitely see the difference. Uh, they are learning so much, and they are becoming so skilled already at, at the bachelor level. Uh, so, so, so getting a job is not a future problem for biomedical students that have this kind of opportunity to learn rather than 
getting taught. So, so students that are really keen have this keen interest that everyone is talking about as well. Uh, that is that is key, actually. Well, that's really great news, I think, to all our participants that the job is not a main concern because that is what everybody's worried about, of course. Uh, Anna Maria, what do you say? What's the ideal math student? Well, um, as my colleague said, a keen interest in the subject is really the key to have a passion for mathematics, for problem solving, for um, rigorosity um, in arguments. To, for logic and uh, then also for if you're interested in applying this to um i mean pretty much everything <laughs> could um science and economics um yeah but uh, yeah the Korean experience is really passion for the subject um being prepared to um work hard if you do it with uh, passion then um and have fun in the process. I think that these are the, <laughs> um, what we look for in our students. I think that's uh, very good. Uh, thank you all. Um, uh, Magnus talked a bit about getting a job after uh, you graduate from a program in my biomedicine that the job prospects appear to be good uh, in that particular area. And of course, international students in particular would like to predict their chances of getting either employment or continue perhaps to do a master's level program um, after they finish a bachelor here. Um, do you have anything uh, to say about this? How, how many uh, students typically progress to master's level because this is an opportunity for students of all of these programs that they can move into a master's after they finish their bachelor's. Uh, how common is that? Or do students typically finish after bachelor's and try to get a job in maybe private or public uh, sector? Do you have any idea about this, Ulrich? Uh, what's it like in physical geography? I would say that uh, today most students they go for a bachelor for a master degree after the bachelor maybe 10 to 15 percent that uh, try or gets a job after the they finish their bachelor degree but some of them after a couple of years uh, outside the academia they come back to to get their masters and then uh, from the master's program I would say that around 20% they continue towards a PhD degree. Uh, so it's the uh, opposite as from the from the bachelor, most students they continue, but from the master degree, most students they get a job. And uh, job opportunities for physical geographers, uh, actually already after the bachelor program is quite good, uh, not least since there has been such a boom in geographical information systems in the society around us. So uh, um, municipalities and uh, consultancy companies, they are hiring uh, students with, uh, with that uh, competence. Uh, but of course, if you persist and you also have a, a master degree, the entry level will be a bit higher than if you just come with your bachelor degree. You will get a, bit, a little bit better position and, of course, uh, more uh, a higher salary, more money in in the pocket. So that's why I guess most they continue. But do you see that there is uh, occasionally at least people who decide to to work a couple of years before they come back to do uh, do the masters. Uh, but it's not obligatory to have work experience to join a master's. You, you can join right after the bachelor's, right? Yeah, and, and most students, they do. But we have had uh, students that uh, uh, have written their um, bachelor degree thesis uh, in uh, collaboration with uh, companies or uh, uh, municipalities or communities, uh, governmental organizations. And they actually got recruited even before they had their degree. So, and we also have internship courses for our students that can also lead to uh, employment. But in many cases, uh, they it seems like our students, they feel that 
well, I actually want to dig deeper into some fields. So they come back after a couple of years of experience and they, they graduate from a master's level and then they, they really set off for their work career. Mm. Hanno, what's it like at the physics department? You, you have several physics master's programs that students can potentially progress into. Yes. Yes, and I think I think that is generally a very popular route. So um, it, it depends, of course, a little bit what your interest is. Um, so I think physics gives you um, very again you have a very broad education and you 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 learn abstract problem solving skills which are very sought after. Uh, you you get you gain technical skills. Uh, you're typically good with things like data analysis um, and you generally a lot of IT related skills. So I think a lot of students actually end up in. Yeah, IT related or data analysis, so kind of big data as a keyword uh, fields, and that can be so that can be you know financial sector even more so. Um, it's of course always a little bit hard. You can it's a lot easier to just keep track of the students that uh, continue with research because uh, you know you typically meet them again at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so, but there's a lot of different companies, and a lot of them are actually related to research. So we have students that end up. Um, uh, for example, in uh, Fisher Scientific, who do all kinds of measurement uh, tools and kits, uh, or Hamamatsu, which are it's a, it's a Japanese company doing uh, photosensitive detectors. That's just a couple of students that I know, or, or people are working at research facilities, for example, ESS or so. Um, but of course, many do continue with their master, and um, many have an interest in, in, in research and, and, and do that before they move on. And I think what Ulrich said is, is very true, that that tends to give you a more sophisticated and more advanced jobs if you either do a, a master or even maybe a phd but i think in any case with with physics the job opportunities um, there's there's plenty and it really depends on also what you focus on uh, of course during your during your um during your studies for example if you know if you if you gain experience and do atomic physics and you're good at lasers for example or you do and, and you know nano um nanotech and, and and have competences that are sought after there so material science or so so it, it depends a little bit what what you're what you're after but there's there's definitely opportunities to steer towards uh, the job that you're interested in in, in having thank you Hanno. uh what about uh, your students magnus do they typically move into the the master program in biomedicine they do john um, um just as hannah said uh, there as well we have some of the bachelor students that move on to suppliers uh, of uh, biomedical equipment or whatever and work as consultant or uh, within the medical uh, or method development or such but definitely more than 90 percent continue into the master's program and it could be not only masters in biomedicine but also public health is quite uh, uh, usual that they, they select or, or uh, uh, bi biochemistry or something like that. So uh, and approximately 50% of that cohort of, of students look to get even higher within a, I mean, a PhD or so. But now we ha also have um, a broader collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry, which we haven't really had during the Swedish program. So uh, it's, um, I wonder how it will look in the future, in the upcoming four or five years, uh, perhaps more students will also move into the pharmaceutical industry and, and work there already with a bachelor. But uh, for now, definitely more than 90% move on to the masters. Uh, I'm interested about the pharmaceutical industry. Are you referring to kind of the regional, uh, pharma, yeah. uh, the so-called Greater Copenhagen region or a certain yeah. region pharmaceutical industry mostly? Yeah. Yes, I I am. We have some some ph pharmaceutical industries also in Lund, of course, yeah. at Medicam Village, and we have uh, a cooperation with, with that. Um, those companies that are, are there, but also with uh, uh, huge, larger uh, bio biomedical companies, Novo Nordisk, for example, uh, Ferring, Lundbeck in Copenhagen. And it's just uh, like 30 minutes by train from Malmö, and then you are in Copenhagen. So so it's really from here, it's not a problem to, to really get into these huge companies, which is great experience for all, all the students as well. So we, we start more and more to collaborate with those and, and they have this like insight that this is a win-win situation for them so first we don't have to pay them to come because they they, they do it for free if they can recruit students for, for uh, future jobs so um, it's a win-win situation for us mm. well, Anna Maria would you like to describe your students the bachelor students do they typically move into one of your master's degree programs 
Yeah, the vast majority of our students um, continue at the master level, and we have two master programs at the moment with three different specializations. So it's uh, pure mathematics or theoretical mathematics, it's numerical analysis. So that's uh, one master pro program that you enter by you can end up with two different specializations. And we also have a separate master's program in mathematical statistics. Also, we are um, hoping to open a, a new master program in um, scientific computing in cooperation with other departments at the Faculty of Science, and this is planned to open uh, 2023. So we are in the process of developing the, the, the curriculum, syllabi, and so on. Um, but um, our students, as they have the, the possibility to combine mathematics with other subjects, they can also move to other master programs. So um, combining maths with economics, you can move into, into that area. If he, of course, physics, if you're studying, um, I mean, in, within the bachelor's program in maths, you can actually study up to 60 credits in, in, in physics. And you could uh, opt for a double bachelor, it's possible, or you can jump, um, study some more physics and um, courses that stand alone and jump into a master's program in physics. Uh, computer science, it's uh, also a very um, popular combination. Um, artificial intelligence, so our students are very interested in those programs and the combination with, between maths and, and computer science. So, um, Mathematicians uh, end up in <laughs> pretty much all over. So, and okay. of, of course, uh, I would say many of them are also interesting in pursuing a PhD in mathematics in different areas. And um, yeah, um, they are highly ranked. Our best students uh, have great chances to, to getting into a, a doctoral studies. Uh, not only here at Lund University, but in other places, both in Sweden and abroad, because they stand very well. Great. So many exciting opportunities here. Um, we've been, I want to kind of tag along to this question because we've, we've talked about uh, moving on to a master's or possibly moving on to, to work, uh, working in the industry and coming back for a master's and so on. But what about during the program? Because I'm thinking that many of our applicants come directly from high school. Maybe they don't have a lot of uh, practical experience. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, pract the, the possibility of getting some practical experience during the studies, the, whether that is in terms of research projects or doing an internship or Ulrich was mentioning thesis collaboration with the industry, for example. So if we can have the panelists speak about the opportunities in, in their program for gaining some practical experience during their studies. Let's start with Magnus. Well, um... Biomedicine is a very practical program. It's a, it's a lot of application that you do during already the first semester when you're there. And uh, we study uh, chemistry and biology of the cell. You will you will have to solve problems related to these practical skills. You have to use those practical skills, and it's not only lab skills, but also skills like writing and reading and interpret and, and use scientific references and uh, and argue stuff like you you really need to do that is just as practical as being in the lab and solving the problems but then we also have these summer scholarships at the faculty of medicine so most students in biomedicine they apply for a summer scholarship they got some uh, small payment uh, which is like uh, 2000 euros i think over a summer it's 20,000 Swedish crowns, yes. So approximately for, for uh, working eight weeks in a lab. And uh, that is so valuable for, for the students. It's open for both uh, biomedical students and, and med students, but uh, most biomedical students actually get them because they are more skilled when it comes to that kind of application. And uh, you also help with research and uh, be part of the frontier scene biomedical research. So there are a lot of opportunities to really working with practice. It has been some more, some, somewhat more limited during the, the pandemic, of course, because we have not been there, but uh, those students that uh, were uh, assigned last year, they will get their opportunities this upcoming summer. So yeah, a lot of opportunities. Great. Uh, what about you, Anna Maria? You mentioned it a little bit, but the practical 
uh, possibilities and opportunities if you study math? Well, unfortunately, at bachelor's level, they're a little bit more limited because maths is more a theoretical subject. So uh, you need to, to uh, build up your um, basis and then move to applications to, you know, in order to get internships and work in companies and so on. So it's typically more at master's level that our students and especially in, I would say, numerical analysis, mathematical statistics that they uh, get internships in companies and so on. But in pure mathematics, uh, possibilities are more restricted. It's, it's kind of due to the nature of the subject. Yeah, that's understandable. Yeah. Build a good base first as well, it's important. Um, Hanno, what about physics? Yeah, so um, yeah, we also have a lot of uh, practical uh, laboratory exercises where you, where, you, where you can work on, on an experimental skills. Um, and these typically are at research labs, uh, in the, at least the later stages of, of, the, of the bachelor program. So you get to work alongside of, uh, scientists and, and researchers. Um, and of course, the thesis work is also possibilities to do uh, um, yeah, collaborations. Usually, um, whether I'm mostly aware of are these, uh, for example, large research infrastructures that I mentioned before. Um, there are also collaborations with companies. This is more field specific, of course. So uh, our group has a collaboration um, with uh, Escobay, which is a Swedish nuclear waste management company, for example. Um, but that is that's very specific to the field. So I can't really comment on that. Like I said, it's very broad and depends a lot. Um, I guess particle physics will have fewer contexts to, to companies than, for example, nanoscience or so. Um, so, but, but it's definitely a possibility. Again, I think the freedom increases at, at master level and that might be more, more common there. But at, even at bachelor level, that's definitely a possibility. We also have project work courses. So that's something that you can also uh, look for yourself. So it's a, it's a course, basically. You have a supervisor at the university, um, but you can perform work uh, even elsewhere, depending on kind of what you're interested in. So that's also a possibility. Um, but that's very individual in a sense. Uh, so uh, depending on what you what yeah what kind of project you 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 find, and you're being offered. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Ulrich, you you already mentioned this a little bit before, but would you uh, repeat a little bit about the practical opportunities within your program? We are a, a, a field based uh, uh, topic like biology geology, so. We want our students to do a lot of fieldwork, be outside. And uh, we have maybe less of, when we are in the lab, it's mostly in computer labs, uh, handling a digital uh, environmental data. But already from the first course, so, uh, starting the, the bachelor program, our students, they spend a week uh, out in the field, uh, learning how to handle different, uh, instruments in order to collect uh, environmental data and uh, do some uh, basic mapping and we continue with that so through the program we always have some field uh, components we have excursions where students they learn more about landscape we also have contacts with the, the industry so that they see how people that has graduated how they are uh, working in their uh, daily assignments uh, within uh, municipalities and communities and and we uh, towards the end of the program we actually also have a, a, a field course outside Europe where uh, for many years we've um, been uh, traveling to Tunisia but we've also been to Iran, we have been to Iraq, we have been to Kenya, we have been to Sri Lanka, we have been to Uganda for many years, and um, I think uh, next course will be in Rwanda, also in East Africa, because we want our students to get impressions from also environments that are quite different from ours where the processes and the socio-economical factors influencing uh, landscape development are different than they are in in say more wealthy richer richer countries we see that as in, very important and important to learn not just to analyze things, but also to gather the raw data that you need in order to describe and analyze processes in landscape development all over the world. 
Excellent. I think we had a, actually a question in the Q and A about an introduction to physical geography and ecosystem sciences, and I think uh, Ulrich, you provided a, a few really interesting examples of what students might expect uh, in in the program. Um, I am always curious about uh, the links between um, ongoing research at Lund University, in particular, and uh, the, the teaching and the education um, that we provide to our students. Um, Magnus, you're, you're an active researcher. Uh, what type of research uh, do you bring into the classroom uh, to, to teach our students? What can they expect? And also a follow-up question to that is, do we teach our students uh, how to perform research? Yes, we certainly do. Um, experimental design is a skill that is really important that we do practice. Um, we, um, I mean, as I said previously, we, uh, all the teachers are also active research scientists. And what, what we bring into class is uh, just not textbook facts, but also real life data uh, that the students have to Try to figure out the i mean how reliable are these uh, sets of data how can they be used what is uh, how can they contribute to the social and individual health that we have um so, so that that is a huge benefit when it comes to to being a researcher as well because you can help students understand publications recent publications not only from lund but also from other parts of the world of course and then try to get a critical view of them um so they are really updated with with, uh, with new research it's not only textbook but but also research already at the bachelor level actually but more and more in in, in the master's level um does it answer your question Johan, or was yeah it... pretty much yeah we can invite yeah. some other panelists to to also explain hanu do you uh are you, you are currently doing research and also teaching yes yes exactly um, I think that's true for most of our teachers. So they 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 all do their own research as well. So I think they also carry that into the courses. So they it's not unusual that in the first year courses we already have at least one lecture, uh, typically the one closest to the exam, where we just uh, uh, give a little bit overview over what what our own research con consists of, and just to um, so that's that's continuously a part of of the education, and of course. Uh, to also um, gain more and more experience through, for example, um, yeah, the laboratory exercises where you you write a report and you you discuss the results that you have and you you connect it with 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 references and literature. We have yeah, seminars and so on, and of course your thesis work, where you you will be working in, within a research group and you will write about a topic that you have researched over a certain amount of time, and I think that that really gives you a very good insight into what it. What it means to be a researcher and whether you you like to continue um, down that path or whether you would rather seek uh, other opportunities hmm. Anna Maria what's it like at mathematics is it very apparent the the research that is being conducted in Lund and outside of Lund and other universities will the will the students get exposed to the most current way of thinking in in mathematics um, I would say not at a bachelor's level because, uh, well, so pure mathematics is uh, it's a little bit special. Of course, everything that students are um, learning in the courses uh, has been at some point in time researching in mathematics, uh, but at the front line now, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a longer distance between the start and the bachelor's program and what's uh, being done by a, a researcher after um, yeah, years of, of studies. Um, so yeah, but that's that's um, in, in pure mathematics, of course, in, in the more applied areas, uh, students are getting closer to um, the front line in the research area. But does that also typically happen then maybe more at master's level, you'd say? Exactly, yes. Okay. What about you, Ulrik? Are you, uh, your department and the research that is being conducted there is that being um, offered to students in within education as well. The latest findings. Well, that's part of the mission, I would say. Being uh, 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 at the university, that you your mission is to link 
uh, research with the education so that you transfer knowledge to the next generation of, of researchers. And as you, the others have said here, uh, all our staff, they are also actively involved in, in different research activities. And of course, you bring some of your research into teaching. As Anna Maria said, also, it, of course, there are some things that uh, has been researched for a long time that is needed in order to understand the basics and the foundation. So here, maybe in the beginning, the, the uh, research component is not so actively shown in the, what we teach. But as you progress through the program and then when you enter, we have five different master's program, different specializations. When you enter at master's level, it becomes even more pronounced, of course. But yes, definitely, we, we use our research as case studies that, where we simplify a bit and then the students can do project work around issues that has been uh, um, part of a, a recent research project. And that is, of course, very important that we demonstrate to the student where the front line is within uh, our field. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, sounds good. I um, I would like to again tag on with a related question because we're talking about research now and uh, whether or not the students get exposed to that and if the teachers are researchers and so on. And one uh, question that we get sometimes uh, from uh, prospective students is about the thesis work because it's not necessarily the case in all countries that you have a thesis at bachelor level and some students are a bit concerned what does this mean what do i actually do how do i find a topic do i get help with this what should my thought process be around the thesis and do i need to have it in mind already when i apply to the program so i would like to hear a little bit from the panelists how that works for your program and how the students should approach this whole daunting <laughs> quest of uh, providing a thesis as a part of their program. Um, should we start with you again, Magnus? Uh, yeah, the, um, you, you have to do a thesis at the sixth semester when you uh, are on the bachelor's program biomedicine and most master's programs in biomedicine do actually require a thesis. So you wouldn't be able to, to uh, enter a program without this thesis. And also what we always say at the first day when we present the program for the students, the new students, is that you need to find a supervisor in a project that is that matching your interest. And it might sound scary to begin with, but it has never failed ever uh, because you will interact with researchers uh, during your education for three years and you will find uh, teachers, scientists that you Think is of particular interest which matches your interest and uh, it's perfectly okay to to ask them for projects and uh, really declare your interest for the topic and uh, it has never been a problem finding uh, a supervisor for students it's uh, because biomedical students are really sought after when it comes to medical research so um and it's it's a huge <laughs> experience i mean if you are a project leader because that is what we tell them you are going to lead this project in three years and they always manage to do that so yeah. that, that sounds comforting at least but do the students need to uh figure this out on the, on their own and approach you or is there sort of a common discussion or or support in this process of figuring out what the topic should be or what project to approach they always know that uh, after a couple of years because mm -hmm. they find their topics of interest. But uh, of course, sometimes we help them. How can I approach this, this researcher? How can I do in order to get his, his or her uh, interest? And, and we come with some, some, some suggestions, uh, reading the latest papers and, and uh, really explaining why they are so interesting for, for, for these uh, future supervisors to, to actually get our students it had never been a problem getting the students out there and uh, they will get the help they need uh, of course to do that but uh, it's rarely happens because they solve it by themselves it's part of the education to take yeah. contact and, and use it so, sounds good uh, uh ulrich what do you say how should students approach the thesis in your uh, department 
It's very much the same process as Magnus just uh, talked about. Uh, we try to implant in the student already from the first day of the bachelor program that uh, start looking around for something that you feel passionate about and, uh, and start to approach and discuss with teachers within that field and try to batter out uh, some kind of research idea. So it's a very ad hoc uh, process, which starts actually from the first day of the program. And then when you come to the um, uh, third year, it becomes a bit more critical. Then we organize some uh, encounters between those who has been assigned uh, with supervising time and the students. So we have like... Uh, 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 marketplace where they can talk with each other systematically we also ask all teachers uh, to post on we have on our web uh, suggestion page where we also uh, uh, invite uh, external uh, actors like um, companies and uh, municipalities and communities if they have a topic that where we most often where we have our alumni, the, our previous students, they can also post uh, topics where they want assistance from a, a, a thesis worker in conducting a, or concluding a specific topic. And then, of course, the proposal is a proposal and uh, the student and uh, the uh, selected uh, supervisor then sits down and talk through the ideas to put it at an angle that suits uh, both of them. So it's, it's an iterating uh, process with a discussion between the student, maybe starting from a very basic idea that eventually end up in a project plan that becomes uh, uh, a bachelor thesis. Interesting. Anna Maria, what do you say about preparing for the thesis in math? Uh, we have quite a structured process. Um, so our program, as I said before, has a, a lot of building flexibility. So you get that solid ground of compulsory courses, but then after one and a half year, you have the possibility to, to start to specialize and choose courses within the mathematical discipline. So pure mathematics, statistics, numerical analysis are our three main disciplines. And we have uh, different degree project courses for the, each, each discipline. And um, during the semester before your loss, so then um, when you kind of plan to, to, um, to do your degree project, you are um, supposed to contact the director of studies. Uh, so that's um, either me or my colleague at the Department of Mathematical Statistics to discuss uh, possible topics. We also have this degree projects are organized as a, a joint course with um, a series of seminars where uh, we have uh, senior uh, professors and um, personnel from the library supporting the writing pro uh, process and so on. So um, it's it's organized like this that we usually match our students with a supervisor um, and try to find suitable projects that suits our um, the, the students interests and also their background um, before the actual semester starts. And, uh, and then everything is organized as a course where the students um, have an env environment where they work together with others in their writing process, but also uh, specifically with their advisor on, on the project that they have. Um, a few of them opt to do a project in cooperation with, with companies, but these are mostly in the applied areas. And some of them want to dive deeper into one specific area of, of mathematics and they can do a literature study. So the degree the projects are um, very different in character. And, and it's, it's in line with what I said before that our students have the possibility of tailoring their own profile. Okay, great. Thank you. And Hanno, how about preparing for the physics thesis? Yeah, I think most of what has been said before applies. In a sense, 
let your curiosity drive you. You don't have to worry about this in the beginning. There is a progression in terms of courses and just work you do is you will learn and you get you will gain the skills necessary. In terms of finding a, a topic, I think um, the supervisors have mentioned several times, it's not just about finding a topic that interests you, um, but also finding the right person to supervise you. And I think that can be as important as the topic in many ways, um, because this person will really also uh, yeah, guide you through the process, guide you towards something maybe even after that and inspire you uh, potentially. So I think it's important that you just look out for interesting fields that you, that you feel like this, this could be something that you would like to yeah, delve deeper into um, and then find someone that you think is, is a suitable person to, to, to you know, tag along basically and, 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 and see, see where the journey goes. Um, so I don't think it's something to worry about. It's just something to have an open mind about and, and, and keep in mind basically. Great. Thank you for that, Hanno. That's very interesting. We get quite a lot of questions about this, actually, about the thesis uh, writing, or uh, because they students from certain countries may not be so familiar with the concept. And uh, in those countries, it may not be necessary to actually create the or make the thesis. Uh, but I have, you, the time is almost running out here. I have actually one question that struck me just now is that I would like to hear from each uh, and everyone here of, of the panelists, uh, can you give some advice to students who successfully apply and get an admission offer and plan to join us here, maybe in the autumn of 2022, how should they prepare before they actually come here, especially if they come from a country or culture that might be a bit far away where the education system is, is, is uh, different? Do you have any advice for how they should prepare so that it's easy for them to, to start and join the program and they know what to expect from day one, as it were? Magnus, what would you say to especially international applicants who, who, who will join us here? Yeah, before you uh, arrive to learn, you will uh, get uh, some material to prepare. And that will contain both videos and text and make sure to spend some time with that because that will align you pretty much with which you with where we will, will start so take that seriously and, and definitely look at those videos answer the questions and, and look at the text that, that we send you because that will prepare you all right thank you ulrich what would you like to tell admitted students who who, who will join us here maybe next autumn but they don't exactly know how to prepare uh, because they don't know what exactly what to expect because maybe they come from a different country or culture. Well, uh, of course, what Magnus said it is relevant also for us. You will get some materials that you can use for a more academic uh, preparation, but then maybe um, I know that uh, the external relations you have uh, uh, a facility where you can chat with a student um, and maybe that's a, that's a good idea if you can find a student from uh, your own home country that is already at Lund University with whom you can discuss what was the worst shocks that you they got when they arrived here so you can maybe prepare a little bit for that but otherwise uh, to have an open mind will take you quite far I guess. Right. Uh, Hanno, what, what would you tell admitted students this you should do before you come or when you are preparing to come here for an easy start, as it were, uh, in the program? Yeah, that is a very good question. I think the advice that uh, you just heard is, is, is very good and very applicable to physics as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think there's nothing that can replace being here and <laughs> experiencing it yourself. Um, I think talking with other students is, is very good advice. If you can do that beforehand, and especially do it all to during the time, talk with people, get to know people. I think having study colleagues you, that you work together with and study together with is really crucial. Um, both from a perspective, you know, you, you you create networks that you can that help you later on to find jobs, but also during your studies that help you to maybe you know they will soften the blow of anything that you might not understand immediately or you know both academically but also in terms of maybe the, the cultural differences i think that'll that'll help tremendously 
Um, otherwise, uh, it is not so that I, mean, I think university is different from high school. Um, there will be there, there is an adjustment period for anyone, and, and that applies also to Swedish students. And so, of course, we have taken that into account and designing the program that there is a transition period, um, and and there so um, and all students kind of have to navigate this new space and, and environment. So just follow along and talk with other people. And I think you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, good advice. Uh, it's true. It's also for local students who have not studied at university before. There is a kind of a learning curve when you start university the first time. Anna Maria, what would you tell admitted students? How should they prepare to for an easy start to, to your program? Well, um, there is really a lot of lots of information on uh, our website uh, at Lund University um, record um, regarding arrival and how to prepare. Um, and there are, as as far as I know, um, recorded webinars from uh, with our students with um, hands on tips for the newcomers. Um, for students coming from sunny countries, uh, make sure that you pack something uh, cozy and warm. Um, I got a student from Costa Rica and she was uh, complaining a little bit about the cold and for Swiss, it's not that cold, but yeah, if, you, if you're used to 30 degrees for all your life, uh, autumn in Sweden can be a little bit chill and a little bit dark. So uh, prepare for that um, somehow, <laughs> I don't know, cozy clothes. Um, learn how to bike if you don't know that already, uh, because uh, we kind of bike a lot in, in, in uh, Lund. Um, it, it's, um, it's very practical. <laughs> um, and yeah, regarding materials and so on, um, we will send you this thing. So just make, make sure that you read it and um, reach out to uh, former students um, from, or yeah, current students reach out to us and you'll be fine. Yeah, very good advice. So bike, warm clothes, vitamin D supplements, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and prepare for your studies, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Checking the, everything that you receive. Uh, well, you'll be receiving a lot of emails, both from us centrally at the university and also as the panelists mentioned, directly from the program in terms of getting into the academics. So we'll have the opportunity to prepare well, Johan, we're hitting the last minute here of this webinar, so um, thank you for powering through, those of you who are still around with us, and certainly for a big thank you to the panelists as well. I think this was very enlightening, both for us and hopefully our participants and uh, everybody watching this video. Uh, the recorded uh, video of this webinar uh, after. We know that many of you are unable to match the time zone to watch this live, but the video recording of it will be available on our website starting Monday. Um, so you'll be able to watch it after. Johan, do you have any? No, I just want to say thank you to all the panelists for joining. It was very enlightening for for us and hopefully for the participants as well. Uh, always a pleasure to hear from you guys. Uh, so thank you very much. And I would like to wish any and all applicants the best of luck. Yeah, and I've posted some links in the chat as well um, if you have any questions after this event. So thank you everyone for joining and see you soon. And uh, hopefully we will see your application later in this application round as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Without further ado, uh, let's start with the panelists introducing themselves, uh, who they are and which programs they work with. So let's start with uh, Madeleine. Yes, thank you. So my name is Madeleine. I'm the program coordinator for the Bachelor of Science in Development Studies program. A long name, but not the longest one we have, I heard today. <laughs> Um, basically, I work with uh, helping the students in the program structure their studies. I think we will go into that a little bit later, how it works. And I just help them plan maybe for future studies, for a career. And I also answer questions, of course, from students who want to apply. So I'm happy to be here today to, to answer any questions you might have. Perfect. You will get questions for sure, Madeleine. So, Igor. Hi. Uh, thank you, Madeleine. 
Uh, my name is Igor Kvicinic. I'm the program coordinator for the International Business Program and also an academic advisor at the Department of Business Administration. So what I do when uh, I work with the program students are, is pretty similar to what Madeleine does with her program students. And, but besides that, I'm also the academic advisor. So I have a lot of conversations one-on-one -on -one with students in general outside the program as well. Great. And Jako. Yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Jakos Zadran. I am the program director of uh, the Bachelor of Science program Economy and Society. Um, I have a slightly different function um, than, than Madeleine and Igor, I suppose. Um, my responsibility is to teach in the program and to oversee that all the various courses in the curriculum are aligned, etc. So that's what I do. Yeah, great, great. Uh, so let's start with a very uh, simple uh, warm up questions here for the panelists. I would like to ask, this is a very common question we get. Uh, I would like to ask how uh, large is the program? How many students roughly are, are in your programs? And also how international, uh, what is the, the division between international students and, and local students? Uh, let's go the same way around. So we start with Madeleine again. Yes, so in, uh, in my program, we have between 80 and 100 students per year. Uh, about 50% are Swedish students and of course, the other 50% are international students, so it's it's quite a good mix. Um, and of course, everything we do is in English. So I think as an international student, you can feel very welcome in the program, even though, of course, we still have um, a lot of Swedish students as well. But you, that's also a way to get to know uh, Lund and Sweden a bit more. Right. And Igor, how many are there in the international business program? In general, we have between 70 and 80 students per year, um, and the mixture is usually 50-50 between Swedish students and international students. Uh, this last year, we had a little bit fewer international students because of the corona pandemic, of course. Uh, so we have 66 to 34 percent for this year, but the next year we're planning to have 50-50 again, good mixture. Okay, very similar numbers there. Is it the same, Jaco, for economy and society? Well, we are, first of all, slightly smaller, uh, on average about 50 students in the program per year. And yeah, I recognize uh, Igor's uh, depiction of, of yeah, usually we aim to have about a 50-50 division of Swedish and international students. Um, over the past year, it was a bit more difficult to achieve that, but I should also add that our Swedish students are quite often very much internationally oriented as well. Um, many of them would already have spent uh, time abroad and quite a few are also the children of expats. So um, yeah, they are Swedish, but then not typically Swedish, I would say. I actually get a lot of emails from those. Uh, I, I work a lot with the United States and we get a lot of Swedish mothers uh, <laughs> calling and saying, I want my child to come back to Sweden to study. So I, I see what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. And I think it's we actually had a question in the Q&A about that, uh, specifically to uh, the Eagle, actually, for the International Business Program. And I, I hope you heard uh, Eagle's explanation there. Um, moving on a bit, uh, I, I would like to know about, because all of these programs are three years, Duration. So I would like to know a little bit about the, the program structure. Uh, what do you start with? What happens in the second year and what happens in the third year, etc. Can you explain uh, to uh, to us and the the um, the participants how the pro how your programs are structured? Shall we start with Madeleine again, please? Always the first one. Yes, I would I would recommend students who are interested in development studies to have a look at our web page because we have a very detailed overview of the program structure. We'll also go through it now, but I think sometimes it's difficult to, to maybe remember everything. So the first year um, we have uh, courses that are um, common for all program students. So the whole first year, everyone studies together. Um, in courses that introduce the subject of development studies and the two, uh, the, sorry, the four majors that we also have within the program. So you get an introduction to, to development studies in general and then to some specific um, focuses that we have within the program. Um, after the first year, you choose your major from four. 
uh, political science, sociology, human geography, and economic history. So the, basically the idea is that during the first year, you kind of get a feel for what you're most interested in. Some students know already when they apply, others maybe change their mind throughout the first year when they see, um, get to know the teachers and the subjects and so on. So during the second year, you have one semester where you do your major, and then you have another semester where you can do elective courses. That can be anything. It can be from Lund University. It can be from other Swedish universities. You can go on exchange. You can, you know, go by yourself to other countries and study. I will not go into like a lot of detail there, but basically it's very, very free. The courses just have to be related to the program. So that's also a way for our students to specialize in certain fields. If you know like, okay, I want to work with environmental questions on a governmental level, for example, then you can sort of focus on, on those issues and so on. And then during the third year, um, we have the, the fifth semester, we have more um, program courses where everyone studies together. And then the sixth semester, is where you write your thesis and there is also possibility to do an internship or minor field studies in a country that you're interested in uh, or you can do a literature review uh, in preparation for your thesis so it's the it's focused on on your thesis and how to move forward after you graduate from the program hmm. that's very interesting can you um can you also explain how you uh, the thesis work that you mentioned here uh, which is uh, I mean, for most students who study at university in Sweden are expected to to produce a thesis at the end, but that may not be the case in other countries. Um, how do you select a, a subject for your thesis and the supervisor, etc.? Uh, how is that uh, typically done? Should I continue? What's the question for me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, it depends a little bit. First of all, um, in our program, it depends on what major you choose, because you will do your thesis at that department. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is um, how you choose your topic. That is a little bit up to you, but quite often our students maybe they work on kind of research proposals and so on throughout the whole program. So you, it's not like you just you go for two years and you have no idea what's going on. You get an introduction to this and you get asked to kind of think of research questions throughout throughout your studies. Quite often people might find something when they go on exchange or they do an internship or whatever it is. And then they say, aha, this is what I'm super interested in. I want to do more research on this. And sometimes it's um, a lecturer that talks about a topic that is just, wow, this is exactly what I want to do. So there is no specific way to do it. There are many, many ways to go about it, but I would say it's not something you have to worry about. It's, it's very rare that I hear about students who have absolutely no idea what to write about because you will, you will get a lot of information how to approach writing a thesis. You will get a lot of possibilities to, to find issues that are interesting to you and that you want to, to write your thesis about. All right. Thank you, Madeleine. Shall we uh, shuffle uh, the panelists around a bit and go to Yakko? Um, can you discuss a bit uh, the, the program structure you have at Economy and Society? Yes, of course, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, so the philosophy of Economy and Society is to provide students with a long-term view of um, economic and social developments. And as a result, during the first semester of your studies here, you will get history courses. We provide you with an overview of economic and social change in the long run. And we have a dual focus. Um, we have a focus that starts with a Western perspective, but we also have an equally large focus on the non-Western perspective. So that is where we start. And then uh, later on during your studies, you will get a number of topical courses on environment, for instance, on business development, on regional development. In addition to this, you will also have the opportunity to take four introductory courses in economics, and these are being taught at the economics department. Um, then moving on, we have a semester with elective packages where you can pick a package that interests you. Um, you can take something from economics, from business, uh, from gender studies, from history and political science, for instance. You can take a more international oriented package, uh, look into developments in uh, China and India, for instance. We have a number of those packages. 
And then, and this is a bit similar to um, the uh, development studies program, there are opportunities to go abroad, to um, have an internship, um, and eventually in your final year, you will be prepared and, and will be preparing for writing a thesis. So I think that is basically the program in a nutshell. But uh, again, uh, there is a good overview on um, the website. So if you want to have a, well, you know, a close look, I would recommend you would take a look there. All right. Thank you, Jaco. And finally, we have Igor for international business. Yes, uh, as Madeleine and Yaku said, uh, if you want to dive deeper into the program structure and look at the courses individually, I recommend you check out the website that we have. Uh, but the broad strokes are that the program is a three-year program. Um, so we have six semesters, 180 credits, ECTS. Um, the main subject within international business is, of course, international business. Uh, so 90 of those 180, half of the courses are within international business. And they range everything from corporate finance, organization, sustainability, entrepreneurship, and marketing, and so on. Um, this first year, the first semester, first courses are three parallel courses, an introductory course in international business, an economic history course, and a statistics course, followed by two courses in uh, international business, and so on. So the first uh, first two years, for first four semesters are obligatory courses within those uh, types of subjects. We also have courses in economics, uh, informatics, business law, and statistics outside of those. During the fifth semester, we have an elective semester, 30 credits, where students can choose to either go abroad on exchange, uh, they can choose to do internship courses, for example, or they can just simply pick elective courses outside of the program, whichever they uh, prefer. And during this last semester, six semesters uh, courses are uh, two bachelor courses and finally a degree project that's 15 credit course where students uh, conduct their thesis work in uh, groups of three people in general. So that's the broad outline of the program. Mm. Great. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Now, uh, I think now we know, understand fully how this, how the programs are, are structured. Um, I would like to challenge the panelists a little bit because now we know what the programs look like and the structure of the programs, but there are a lot of business uh, undergraduate programs out there in the world. There are a lot of development studies programs. So uh, I would like to know what is special about your programs or what is unique or why should as an applicant who is looking to do a bachelor degree somewhere in the world, maybe somewhere in Europe, but kind of on the fence and choosing between uh, different programs, why should they select your specific program? Let's go the other way around and start with Igor this time. Uh, yes. Um, well, first and foremost, of course, I would say if you're inter interested in business and international business, this is the program for you. Uh, if you'd like to know more about global trade and its complexities, this is, of course, the program for you as well. So uh, the program contains the main subject, international business, but also a lot of the uh, business administration courses in general. You learn a broad aspect of all those subjects from corporate finance, as I mentioned, all to marketing, organization, accounting, and so on. And you also have a broad foundation in economics and in statistics, informatics. Um, Outside of that, outside the strictly academic education, we also provide, well, of course, also an academic education, but it's an education based on cases, based on a lot of practical uh, teamwork, group building, uh, case assignments. So it's not just the purely strict classical academic education. A lot of it is based on students learning things and uh, then applying the knowledge and the skills to practicality. So they will be able to go straight out to the work life environment later on. Great. Sounds good. Thank you, Igor. So Jaco, what do you say? Why, why should someone choose economy and society? Yeah, um, basically what we are trying to do is to educate young people who eventually will be able to contribute to changes that are necessary in the coming decades and definitely during the coming century. Um, 
We at our department, the Department of Economic History, uh, believe that one of the problems that we as societies are facing is that um, there are very few people who manage to bridge the gap between economics on the one hand and politics and policy making on the other hand. So what we try to create in our um, Bachelor of Science program is a group of people who can communicate with both sides. And this is something that is quite often missing. So in that respect, we, we try to provide our students with not only knowledge about economics, but also about how the economy developed in the long run, um, how development economics works, and also how society works and society changes. And I think this would be the, the more unique characteristic of the program. Great. I got explanation there from Jaco. So uh, same question to Madeline. Yes, I would say that if you are interested in development issues, this program is relatively, relatively unique, at least in Sweden, because we have this interdisciplinary aspect of mixing four different topics, uh, which gives you a really broad um, kind of base to stand on, especially if you if you want to work directly after or if you want to continue studying, you will have you will see a lot of different ways to approach these questions and not just a specific one. Um, I actually I have some notes from one of our students because I think it's also useful to get to get their perspective. And she said that what she really likes about it is this freedom that I talked about before that you have you have a structure, you have a program, you have a specific degree, but within that you can choose a lot of things for yourself, you can kind of make it into your own program by choosing the major that you want by doing the electives that you want by going on exchange or internships or whatever so you can kind of mold it into to what you want it to be. Um, another thing I would maybe like to highlight is that in general, not just in our program, but at Lund University, there is a very sort of informal atmosphere in many programs, you are allowed to question your teachers, you're allowed to have opinions, you're encouraged to have opinions and to, to question the material and so on. And I think that is a very, very good learning environment to be in. And I think maybe unusual for, for some for students from some other countries. I myself have studied abroad and I was very surprised at first um, to see the, the big difference from, from the Swedish system um, in comparison. So I think that is also something to consider when you're considering studying in Sweden in general. And I think Lund uh, is really, really good for that. For sure, that's a good point. Right. Uh, very interesting points. Um, I, there was one thing that struck me a bit when we talked about the program structure and the fact that most programs at bachelor's level have a, a block of mandatory courses that all students have to take, and then they can choose elective courses. And of course, this can be quite important. Not, I mean, you take a course because you're interested in it, of course, but then you also have to look ahead a bit, perhaps to the future. Uh, you may want to apply for a master's degree program and the master's degree programs in Lund and in, in Sweden often have very narrowly defined admission requirements. So I would like to ask, uh, starting with Ego, how can students in your program, International Business, uh, when should they start looking at, okay, so if I want to become eligible for the, for the master's in accounting and finance, for instance, when do you need to select the appropriate courses to make sure that you're eligible when you finish the program? Yes, uh, it's good to start as early as possible, looking into how how the programs work and what the requirements are. But you will need to find the applicable courses that you need for your requirements for the elective fifth semester. So before that, in general, students who take the international business program here in Lund are they fulfill the requirements for the majority of our master's programs in business administration. So we have programs in strategy and uh, organization, imagine people, knowledge and change, for example, in marketing, entrepreneurship. Uh, those programs, our students fulfill the requirements, uh, whichever elective courses they take. Uh, the example that you stated there with the accounting and finance course uh, program, you have to take some additional courses outside the program, and that is specifically during the fifth semester, you can do that. And in general, the students, or I inform them about that, a year ahead in general, and then we talk about it and more specific individual students that are interested in taking that master's program. All right. Yeah. 
Interesting. Um, Madeleine, how does it work in development studies? Because you also have a master's degree program at the Faculty of Sci uh, Social Science, uh, where your uh, bachelor's students may become eligible. Um, do, do you help? When do you start informing them about this and how do you advise them um, with regard to this? It's a bit of a tricky question because basically from from the development studies program you get a degree within the social sciences so you are eligible for a lot of programs within that field however if for example you want to specialize in your master's then probably you need to consider that before choosing your major uh, for example if you want to do your master's in political science then of course uh, you will most likely need to have those 90 credits as igor talked about before um, in that specific uh, topic so then you would need to choose that for your major and I think that is something that we kind of we talk about it throughout the program that you you should use your major and your elective courses to specialize and you should use that as a way to um, to make yourself eligible for future studies for example on master's level. Mm, very good uh, finally Jaco uh, your program uh, what types of degrees or master's degrees would your uh, students become maybe automatically eligible for, but in other cases, they would have to specialize maybe during their bachelor's studies to become eligible for certain master's programs. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, uh, the master programs that we at the department are running, uh, this is uh, innovation and global sustainable development, and the master in um, economic development, uh, population and growth. Um, yeah, in addition, we see that quite a few students take an interest in economics and they take mandatory economics courses. And in addition to this, we also have an elective package um, with the intermediate economics courses. And this is a, a popular package um, and with the introductory and intermediate uh, uh, economics courses, you would be eligible for doing a master in economics. Um, yeah. And in addition to this, it is a bit as what Madeleine already indicated, um, there are so many master programs that our students would eventually be eligible for or with picking a few um, courses during their exchange studies or during the semester that they can pick electives can prepare themselves for. So um, at my program, as well, it's we, we, we try to encourage the students to, to think early about where their interest is and where they would like to move to after finishing uh, economy and society and uh, yeah, start preparing for that. Yeah, good, good advice, start preparing early. I think this is very interesting what we're talking about now about the structure of the programs, the content and so on. And I want to continue on that track, but just as a small side note here before we do, uh, I don't, I, we have a question in the Q&A that I don't want to leave hanging. And we talked about this a little bit just before we started the webinar as well, because this is an extremely common question. Uh, this specific one is from Madeline uh, and it is uh, about the entry requirements. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the presentation before as well, but this student is interested in applying to the bachelor's in development studies and uh, wants to understand what does the requirement mean that you need to have civics 1a uh, or civics 1b uh, and how can you meet that requirement with a foreign high school diploma. And Madeline, I know both you, both uh, Johan and I and you get this question <laughs> all the time, but could you maybe give a short reply to uh, to the student who's asking here. Sure, I think that is definitely our most common question that we get actually. And the, the problem is that it's difficult to answer because it depends on where you have studied as was already mentioned in the presentation before. So when we get this question, we usually say that you should check either with university admissions or with the admissions office at Lund University because they will be able to give you more detailed information. But basically you need to show that you have taken some kind of social science course as part of your um, high school degree. So in most cases, people are el eligible unless you were in a super specific program uh, in high school, but it's better to check with, uh, with university admissions what relates to, to your specific country. Yeah, 
Thank you, Madeline. Yes, as we said, we get this question very often, and it's the same also for the other two programs here. Uh, today, of course, we get a lot of questions about the mathematics requirements and so on, and it does vary depending on the, the country where you've studied, but feel free to contact us as well, and we can, we can check for you and give you some indication of what might be needed from your particular country. Um, so, yeah, so you will need to as Madeline said, check university admissions and also contact us if you're still in doubt. But uh, I would like to continue on, as we said, about talking about more of the content and the structure of the program. And several of you uh, panelists mentioned internships. And I wanted to, to highlight a little bit uh, on that because we know that many applicants come directly from high school or upper secondary school. They might not have any work experience yet. And of course, they're worried, what happens when I, when I graduate? Will I be able to find a job and so on? And many are eager to get a little bit of practical experience during their studies. So I would like to ask the panelists, uh, panelists what are the opportunities to get interaction with the industry and hands-on experience, whether that is an internship or a thesis collaboration or, or something else? Uh, if we start with Jaco this time. Well, um, it's it's a bit of a tricky question um, because at the moment we, we we are a relatively young program. We started three years ago, so at the moment our first um, students are taking internships, and yeah, we are still a bit first of all trying to figure out where their interest is so there is an internship advisor who tries to help them out a little bit and of course we do have all sorts of connections with um with business and with administration um we we have uh, people taking internships in our master programs as well but it's it's still a bit in flux it is being developed um, at the moment i think we have about 10 10 students taking internships and uh, yeah some of them are taking internships abroad even so combining a stay um, abroad with doing an internship and already uh, preparing for thesis writing so there are plenty of opportunities there is quite a lot of flexibility but um and in my program it's still a little bit fake it will become much clearer over time so i'm, I'm hoping that igor or madeleine will will be able to provide uh, prospective students with a clearer answer <laughs> but Jaco, do the students typically uh come to you with suggestions and say i would like to do an internship here or is it more that the advisor helps them to to find something the advisor would would help them, but quite often students would have um, their own ideas and would already have looked around a little bit. That's that's my impression, at least. Hmm. OK, let's let's uh, hear from Igor. What's the process at international business? Yes, in general, we we do recommend our students to take internships during the fifth elective semester. The most popular part is to go on exchange, of course, and it's perfectly fine to do that, perfectly good. Uh, but we do always uh, keep a little uh, motivation for students and tell them, do an internship uh, that will help you later on. You will have new contacts and companies that will help you get a new job later on. So they can either find an internship by themselves or they can apply for one of the internships that are announced by our career services here at the School of Economics and Management during application period. So those are the two options that they have uh, for those internships. We also, in general, pre-corona, and we'll have it now after corona as well, have uh, industry visits to companies. Uh, not all students can go, of course, uh, but usually like a smaller group of 10 to 20 students from all three cohorts, year one, year two, and year three, can go on an industry visit each year and meet up with uh, the, the real life environment. Yeah, that's great. So they have some opportunities there to get some uh, practical experience. Uh, Madeleine, what is it like in development studies in terms of getting some practical experience? We also recommend it, of course. I think it's really good to also for the students to get an idea of what working in this field will be like if to see it's just really what I want to do. It's a really great way to, to try that out. As I mentioned before, in the sixth semester, we have a 15 credit course, which means 10 weeks where you can do an internship. So that is a little bit shorter um, than in other programs where it might be a whole semester. 
I would say not all of our students uh, do an internship, quite a lot of them, quite a lot of them go abroad, of course, much fewer in the past two years, unfortunately. Um, but it's very, very popular and students say that they really learn a lot from this quite often they go maybe to some governmental organizations or to some international organizations. Uh, we don't have a specific person working as an advisor for internship, but rather we help by publishing ads that we get from different organizations that we think might be interesting. And I know that also the student group have um, a lot of good cooperation in that field. So they recommend different things to each other that they find and so on, because many people are interested in similar things. So um, even though we don't specifically provide support for finding internships, so most of our students who want to go um, for internships find something. and. Yeah, they're very happy with their experiences generally. Mm, thank you. That's uh, it's always interesting. Mean, students are very curious about internships these days, aren't they? I mean, it's a question we get very often because they want to have the feeling that not only will they learn theoretical knowledge uh, or theory, uh, they assume that we will teach them the theory, and but they also want to apply the knowledge in, in some practical uh, way and, and an internship is really a good way to, to do that. Um, can you explain though, it, at, at your programs, what is the kind of, um, how much is theory and how much is more practically oriented type of work? Do, do you ever need to get your hands dirty uh, in, in the international business uh, program, Igor? There we go. Uh, not, not dirty hands per se, but uh, of course, there are some practical elements of the courses. All of the courses are academic courses, but we do focus quite a lot on making the courses relevant for the work environment later on. So we have either cases that uh, we study, either real life cases the companies come with that are actual uh, real life uh, cases or old cases, historic cases that the uh, students uh, implement their knowledge just to learn. Uh, sometimes or quite a lot, we have uh, group assignments, team building events, workshops, seminars. Uh, so. I would say not, not a lot of the time we have lectures, of course, normal, regular lectures with teachers talking and it's, uh, students listening. But uh, a lot of the events are workshops, group assignments. It is quite a practical program, I would say. Mm. What about you, Jaco? Economy and society, is it all theory or is it more, or is, there, is there a practical dimension as well? Well, the practical dimension is a bit similar to what Igor already explained. There is a lot of group work. We want students to discuss. Um, we want them to develop cases, do case studies, um, prepare presentations, and uh, yeah, of course, also uh, uh, write papers, which is a very, very valuable skill for every student who eventually will enter the labor market. I think that ninety percent of our students will end up in in interesting jobs where they have to do research and have to report to their, their co-workers. So in that respect, I think that's a, a very substantial part of, of any type of bachelor program um, would be very practical and would provide you with very hands-on skills that, that are very valuable in your future career. Mm. Madeleine, you're next. I can basically just repeat what has already been said. It's very, very similar in, in our program as well. Um, and I think one thing that a lot of uh, international students are maybe surprised by when they come study with us is that there are not so many lectures on the schedule. So it looks very empty when you see your week. But what that actually means is not that you have the rest of the day off. It means that you're supposed to be doing something on your own. Sometimes it's reading, sometimes it's group work, sometimes it's preparing for seminars. Um, and I think, yeah, you really get a lot of preparation for things that you might need in the future. As, we, as I talked about before, writing research proposals, doing the seminars, preparing a presentation about something. So I think definitely, of course, there is a theoretical aspect. There has to be. That is what we're supposed to provide. But you're also really encouraged to, to participate yourself and to, to use that knowledge. Yeah, can I briefly add something? Sure. What strikes me if I um, walk across the university campus here is that I very often see students not as individuals, but in groups. And this is because they are encouraged to do group work. 
Um, they like to do group work, and this is not only for economy and society, I'm sure it's also true for development studies and international business. And this is also something that we very strongly encourage um, to learn how to work with other people, how to exchange ideas and to how to arrive at conclusions. And you can see this very well captured if you just look around at our university campus. That's very true. We see a lot of group work going on everywhere. Uh, another thing related to the actual studies and study methods and so on, uh, that's important and that we get uh, questions about, are the teachers on the programs? So who are the teachers? Are they researchers? Are there guest lecturers coming in? What is the relationship also between the teachers and the students? Madeleine, you hinted to this before that it was quite different from your experience abroad. So I want to dig into that a little bit. Maybe you can start then, Madeleine, since you already brought this up. Yes. So again, there is there is a big difference um, between Sweden and many other countries. I think that, first of all, one thing that was very surprising when I was talking to um, my fellow exchange students when I was abroad was that we taught, we address our teachers by their first name. So it's not like professor, it's not miss, mister, and so on. So it's very, very informal. And as I said before, you're really encouraged to, to have your own opinion, to, to question what is being said and so on. So I think that is that is a really important aspect. And I think also, at least in, I can only speak for my program, but what I've heard from the students is that there is a very relaxed atmosphere between the students as well. It's not a very competitive program. You are more striving to help each other, to lift each other up rather than just wanting to be, you know, the top student and fighting against each other. So that is not at all the, the atmosphere that we have, which I think is, is really nice. Yeah. And what are they, who are the teachers typically? Are they, are they researchers? Are they doctoral students? Who will they be interacting with? Yeah, I think uh, we have mostly researchers, but again, we have re uh, lecturers from all four disciplines that we have within the program. So you will really meet a lot of people if you come study with us. We also, of course, sometimes have PhD students teaching. And actually the students say that they see that as something very positive because then they get to hear from someone who is really focused in on one specific topic and is really passionate about that. And they feel that that is very inspiring to hear as well. And at the same time, you can have a lecturer who has been you know, teaching and doing research for 30 years. So they have so much knowledge to share. So this mix I think is, is really, really interesting. Yeah, for sure. The dynamic there. Igor, what about the teachers and in international business? Uh, I concur with what Madeline said. In general, our teachers are a mixed bunch of people, so to say. Uh, the atmosphere is quite relaxed when it comes to communicating with the teachers. Of course, all teachers are like all other people and individuals, so some might be a little bit stricter, some are less stricter, but in general, the atmosphere is uh, quite informal. You can talk to the teachers on a first-name basis. And uh, in general, many of them are researchers. We do have some PhD students, uh, lecturers as well. Uh, but we are also a, a mixed bunch when it comes to the international aspects. It's not just the students who come from all over the world. We have teachers from Spain, France, Turkey, Iran, all over the place who are part of the program. And that's kind of the big thing uh, for the international business program that we are trying to mix in the cultures as much as possible to have new perspectives both from the students, staff, and the teachers in general. Well, that's a very good point there that you mentioned, Igor, because we often talk about how international the university is and that we have students from 130 different countries on campus and so on. But it's actually just as interesting, of course, to understand uh, how international the, the body of staff <laughs> and yeah. the teachers specifically are, uh, because that is that will give valuable uh, perspectives as well on the education. Uh, what about economy and society, Echo? Yeah, well, um, you are a teacher. <laughs> I'm a teacher, yes. Yeah. So yes, I yeah. I will be one of the teachers. Obviously, I'm I'm from the Netherlands, which already goes to show how international our department is. Uh, when I first came to the Department of Economic History five years ago, I was quite amazed to see how international it is. Um, in the Netherlands, usually you would get Dutch professors. Um, here it is 
a very, very diverse mix. Um, yeah, typically our, the teachers at, at the program uh, would be postdoctoral researchers. We do not have quite a lot of PhD students uh, teaching. The reason why we have many postdoctoral researchers is because we are very successful in attracting research funding. So we have many uh, early career stage researchers um, who are at our department, who are really at the frontier of research. They really know what is going on. Very enthusiastic um, and uh, very engaging. At least that is what our students tell us. So this is typically what you would get in terms of uh, of the teachers uh, at economy and society um yeah what else should i say yeah of course we we, we also have more senior uh, teachers perhaps such as i i have a little bit of gray hair as you can see um and we also try to throw in a few guest lectures here and there uh, once in a while so yeah i and are the guest lectures typically from the industry or are they visiting from other universities or it's a combination we have courses that are very much oriented towards um yeah sustainability for instance and um, the teachers in those courses have very close connections to people working in industry and also policy trying to well come up with problem with 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 solving problems with respect to environment or answering questions as to how to make sure that that innovation will occur at an increased rate etc so that happens but we uh, quite often also ask uh, scholars from from other countries uh, to join in and uh, we especially did so over the past two years when we uh, because of covid had to do online teaching fortunately we have stopped doing online teaching but uh, I'm pretty sure that we will be able to continue having guest lecturers over because the department is, is a very well uh, bristling community with many people visiting for a couple of weeks, couple of months. So yeah, we will, we will throw those people into the mix uh, frequently as well. Sounds great. Right, so I think I'm kind of curious, you have all explained what students can do within the programs and and also uh, told us about uh, what kind of uh, things that you can learn, like presentation skills, group work, and dealing with people coming from different backgrounds, et cetera. And that's super important for, for your future career, regardless of if you st stay in academia or if you want to join a public or private sector uh, organization or company. But there are two things. I'm going to throw these two, two phrases out there. Uh, critical thinking and analytical thinking. How important is that, Madeleine? I think that is very important. And I think I've touched upon that a little bit before as well, that your this program is really meant to teach you how to analyze and to look critically at different issues. And that is also something that will help you definitely both in your future career, but also if you if you want to continue studying. And I think that is something that is encouraged throughout all the courses that we have. Right, because I mean, it's often so that in many programs, um, students, perhaps when they start their studies, they don't know exactly where they will end up in the future, what type of career you will have, or uh, either because of the, the, the courses you take or, or the, the experiences that you have within a program, but definitely students can count on being taught the importance of critical thinking and analytical thinking through the work they do. You, what, what do you say, Jacko? Yeah, definitely. Um, our students uh, eventually will get the title Bachelor of Science, which means that um, an education in science is a very, very important element of, of our teaching. Um, so yes, this involves critical thinking. It involves um, a critical evaluation of sources and of theories and of claims that are being made, obviously. And analytical thinking, um, likewise, we will teach our students uh, which methods they can use to analyze and evaluate. So it is, it is very, very much at the core of everything that we do in, in economy and society. And I'm pretty sure that this will also apply to the other programs, but perhaps Igor can confirm this. 
Yes, Igor, welcome to confirm <laughs> what yeah, Chaka just said. Yeah, I can confirm that. And as we've talked before, uh, we mentioned quite a lot about the group works and the practicalities of the programs, but the, as mentioned, international business program as well as an academic scientific program. So students are here to learn and here to foster individuals who can think clearly for themselves and have critical thinking and analysis when it comes to uh, business, international business, global trade, and the complexities of the whole uh, field. And uh, outside of that, as uh, Yakko mentioned briefly as well, academic writing is a big aspect of our program. And we have our uh, academic skill services here at the School of Economics and Management, uh, quite a big part of the program. And they interact with the students early on. Uh, we, in general, our students are well-versed in academic writing when they come, but we also want to support them early on uh, as much as possible so that when they come to the last year, the thesis work that they do as good as possible during that work. Mm. Excellent. That's, that's interesting. And I, I think speaking of critical thinking, I think that for, for the masters, we have a, a pretty good idea about how students can interact with research groups and maybe they can you know, join a, a project to write their thesis and so on. But what's the situation when it comes to bachelor students in terms of interaction with the ongoing research at Lund and the surrounding world? A lot can happen in three years, of course. Are they completely isolated from this or do they get some opportunities to sort of uh, interact and understand more about the research going on? Because perhaps they know already that they want to go into an academic track. Um, so what are their opportunities to, to get some research experience or insight in, in research already during the bachelors? We start with Yako. Yes, well, plenty of opportunities, first of all, because of the teaching staff that will uh, discuss ongoing research, but will also always keep an eye out on current events, because this is, in the end, what we try to understand. Um, economy and society is about change, and change is everywhere. It's ongoing, and we provide a, well, specific take on understanding change. So there is there is a constant, well, back and forth between what is happening now, how can we understand this, what are the precedents, um, what have we learned over the past decades or perhaps even centuries that can help us to, well, to predict um, in which direction we will be headed. And I can tell you that I, I quite often see uh, student papers and in their papers, um, our students uh, engage in this way with current events, um, trying to explain to the reader um, how to make sense of what is happening now. And uh, over the past couple of months, I've read a few popular science pieces some of our students have published in, in, in some of the journals um, of the um, uh, student unions here in Lund. And I think that, uh, yeah, if, if you at a, as a prospective student would like to understand what you would do here or could do here, I would encourage you to, to take a look at those websites, for instance, where you can also see some of the results of bachelor students even, who already managed to, well, engage a little bit in, well, discussing current events. Yeah, that's impressive, writing uh, those kind of articles already <laughs> as a bachelor student. Uh, what about in your program, Madeline? Yeah, I think it's a bit similar that you also you get introduced to different topics through the lectures that you have and what they specialize in and so on. I would also like to point to the fact that we when we look at the kind of course literature, usually you have a few books that are like part of your the main curriculum. But at least in our program, the, the lecturers also try to give you some kind of maybe recent changes or new theories or just articles about world events that are relevant to what you're learning and so on. So you always get both this kind of theoretical base of maybe theories that have been used for 10, 20 years, but also you see how it is changing and how it is being approached today. So I think there is, and I think that is very useful because there is, it's good to have both what happened before, but also what is happening right now. And I think we have this mix quite well in, in the development studies program. Yeah, for sure. Having that historical perspective is an important part as well. Uh, Igor, 
international. Yeah, I think Kiyako and Madeleine covered the topic yeah. pretty well there. Uh, it's, it's quite similar in the international business. Uh, in general, we have for the courses, students have one or two books uh, that are based on theory and history uh, of the subject, but the teachers who are in general researchers like to include new uh, developments and of course connecting to real life development as well in the world and the students as well they do like to apply what they learn to what is happening outside of the school so it's kind of from both parts you have the as mother mentioned books the, the theory the background and then you apply it to real life uh, events and cases both in companies and society in general Mm. Thank you, Igor. Um, I was sitting here thinking a little bit. I, it, international business and economy society are not brand new programs, but you are kind of new-ish. Uh, but you you have produced graduates from these programs, and I was wondering. Oh, you haven't economy and society not yet. You're in your third year now. The uh, hopefully um, by June we will have our first batch. First batch graduate. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So maybe this question is more for Igor and Madeleine then, because you have uh, development studies is a, is a, a, a rather old program. Uh, you have produced many uh, alumni uh, and international business uh, is, is a bit newer. But can you tell us a bit about how many of your graduates typically go on to do master's degree programs and how many would maybe just uh, try to find a job and Eventually, perhaps they will return to school, but uh, do you have an, any statistics or information to, to give our uh, viewers on this? Igor? Yeah, uh, we don't have statistics per se, so no, not clear numbers how many go on to master's and how many go uh, and work directly at the program, but we do have uh, an alumni group, both for the school itself on LinkedIn and the program itself. So in general, from what I see there, many are quite, uh, out and uh, working in companies, organizations, NGOs, for example, uh, both in Sweden, so international students who come to Sweden to study and now work in Sweden, and uh, Swedish students and international students who are working abroad somewhere. Uh, but we do have students applying to our master's program as well. Uh, the, the amount of students between the two, I cannot say, but I, I I guess maybe 20%, 25% go on to master studies uh, as of right now. Yeah, and I think maybe we could say that it, it, students are not guaranteed progression. You have to prove yourself and, and apply to a master's program in competition with other students. And so you have to really work hard during your bachelor's and make sure that you have uh, good merits coming out of, of the course. program. Of yeah. course, yeah. In general, when it comes, I think it's the same thing for um, quite a lot of master's programs in the university, but there are programs in business administration. Uh, we have applicants from all over the world. So our students compete on equal footing with those students, uh, usually with a statement of purpose uh, and their grades from the international business program. Mm. Madeleine, you have produced uh, many, many alumni. Uh, what do they do after they finish the, the Bachelor of Science and Development Studies? I unfortunately also don't have any specific statistics on how many people start working directly after and so on. Um, I know that quite a lot of people stay in academia and go on to a master's uh, studies. I, I know that also a lot of our students who get a job straight after graduating, they have made some kind of connection during their studies. So maybe when they were on exchange, they got to know an organization abroad, for example, that they were interested in working with. Maybe they did their internship there, maybe in some other way, um, they found out about some organization or some company or whatever that they want to work at. So I think it is very, very useful if, if that is your goal to, to start working immediately after you graduate, then you can use the program for that um, to a good extent, I would say. But then again, yeah, I think also many of our lecturers encourage people to stay in academia, of course. Um, they That's what they <laughs> like doing. And I think that is also uh, the development studies program is a good base, as we talked about before, because you get a lot of uh, different perspectives. And then if you go on to master's studies, that's a way to specialize even further in, in a field that you're interested in. Right. So the, the bachelor's programs, they provide a foundation and then 
uh, it's it, for a master's level you are going to be assumed to have this foundation uh, before you join or, uh, so that would be, because they don't start at the you know with the beginners level courses you they're advanced level I would like to tag on to this question a little bit. Uh, now we spoke about what do they do? Do they go on to a master's or do they go on to the job market? If they do choose to go on to the job market, what kind of jobs can they expect normally? I mean, where, well, for Madeline and Igor, based on what you have seen, where, where do the students move on to? And for Jaco, maybe what is in your mind that the students will be able to, to move on to after the program? What kind of jobs, what kind of roles uh, could you envision for, for the graduates? Uh, we can start with Jaco. All right, yes. Um, we can only uh, hope at this moment that I am correct in stating uh, my expectations, uh, but the ambition is that our students will be able to land positions in, in government, um, in policy making, but also in the private sector, um, in, in doing um, analytics, in determining and setting um, the future uh, steps for, for a private business. Um, so this is in part what we are looking for, but I could also very well imagine that our students would um, progress into um, yeah, more research oriented careers such as investigative journalism, for instance, um, yeah, those kind of things. But the thing with, with these bachelor studies is that it, it opens up a wide array of possibilities and it is impossible to predict where your students will end up. You, you will definitely have a very, very good and solid base for any future career. And my experience from having worked at other universities and other programs is that people end up in the strangest places, but eventually are very happy and successful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's let's hope that this will also be true for uh, for our students. I'm sure it will be, and I think especially if you have very young students who, who came directly from from high school, I, I think it makes sense to have a program that opens up a lot of different opportunities because you might not be set on one specific thing already uh, at that age. Igor, uh, what's the situation for your graduates in terms of the job market? Yes, uh, in general, the aspirations for many of our students are usually that they want to have some kind of managerial positions, of course, it can be financial manager, it can be business development manager, human resource management, uh, those types of jobs, of course, those are usually not the first jobs that they receive, so they have to work their way up, uh, but uh, I've seen students who become now marketers, uh, uh, some are, are working within human resources, for example, some are consultants, so all kinds of different jobs. And as Jaco said, it's not always easy to know exactly where you will end up eventually, uh, even, you might, even though you might have a plan for five years or 10 years or so on. Uh, and when it comes to international business, it is such a good broad base of uh, subjects that you have with you. So you can start up working within finance, for example, and then move on and work within uh, marketing or accounting or strategic positions later on. So it's, it can go wherever you would like, like it to go within the field of subject then. So, sounds great. <laughs> Madeline, uh, is it the same for your program that uh, options are many? I think that was a very good summary. And I think it's important to, as we've already mentioned, to see a bachelor degree as kind of an introduction in a way. You will learn a lot of things, but it doesn't mean that when you graduate, you know, you will know what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And I think that goes for a lot of our students as well. As, as Igor mentioned, they also come to us, they say, I want to work in the UN. I want to work for my you know, home country's governmental administration and so on. And sometimes that definitely happens, but maybe not right away. So I think it's really good to, to keep that in mind that you kind of, you, you work your way through. And sometimes um, you follow that straight line and you, get, you end up exactly where you want to be. Sometimes along the way you notice, ah, but actually this is much more interesting. This is what I want to do. So I think it's, it's good to keep an open mind. And I think, I hope that we also, that is also something that we give to our students, kind of that knowledge and teaching them to, to have some critical thinking when it comes to their own goals as well, because sometimes your idea of something is not necessarily correspond directly to the reality. And sometimes 
you realize that actually, well, this is what I'm really good at. This is where I can make a difference. And this is where I can use my, my skills and my knowledge. Great, I very inspirational. I feel like going back to school now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I think that Madeline's point here was really interesting to 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 prepare students uh, to have realistic expectations uh, for what's going to happen after what might happen after the program. But also, I'm thinking, uh, especially perhaps for international students who are not so uh, used to uh, the way things are done in Sweden, what kind of expectations should they have before joining the program before coming here how should they you know mentally prepare uh so that they don't end up disappointed because it, the program that they got admitted to is something completely different from what they thought um so how how would you like to what type of advice would you give prospective students so they they come in with the right set of expectations and uh, that you're able to you know uh fulfill their expectations uh, Igor, what do you say? What what types of advice would you give prospective students here so that they come in with the right kind of attitude? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. I haven't thought about it before. Um, I would say be prepared and have a positive attitude about the program, but also be prepared for the unpreparable. So it's not going to be exactly as you imagine it, as Madeleine mentioned about the work uh, jobs that you're going to get eventually. The same thing applies to the programs. It's not going to be exactly as you imagine it but it, it might be better, it might be worse, it might be both. Uh, so be prepared, come with a positive attitude. You will meet new people that are like minded like you, interested in the same subjects, teachers, and uh, also maybe be prepared for the Swedish weather <laughs> and the, the winter months, that would be a good idea. So you're not, you're not exhausted when the darkness comes and uh, during winter, but in general, just uh, with a positive attitude and an interest in the subject at hand, I think, uh, whatever steps that you need or obstacles, uh, it will not be a problem, you will solve it eventually. Yeah. Mm, excellent. I think also I, I like to tell people or prospective students to really do their homework before they apply to a program, because sometimes we, we you know, encounter people who they, they read the, the program name, the title and think, ah, that's me, that's, that's what I want to do. And then they don't bother, you know, looking into the exact details of the of the courses or the program structure etc and then they may uh, join us with a, a an inappropriate set of expectations <laughs> but uh Jaku, what would you tell prospective students so what's what's a good attitude to have when to before they join your or when they join your program well, I think that, that Igor already summarized a few key elements, and that is to be prepared for the unprepared. I mean, I think most of the students will, for the first time, enter university, may have some vague notions. I remember when I started to study, I had some very vague notions, and I was incorrect in all accounts. Um, but that's also nice. I mean, you you enter a new new type of world, which is challenging and also ultimately very rewarding, I would say. Um, I think it, and this is again, is a, is a point Igor already made, um, try to read a little bit. We have excellent websites, uh, program uh, websites where the program structure is being explained, where you can click on the uh, specific courses to see what courses are about. And I would recommend students to surf a little bit on the websites of the uh, department so you can get a bit of an understanding of what the staff, what the researchers are doing. Um, I mean, you can easily spend a couple of hours looking into what your future teachers are interested in. And this should give you a pretty good idea as to what the topics will be that you will be exposed to. The final thing I would say is that um, Lund University um, has um, this unibody system. There are students you can chat with, and I would strongly recommend that um, new students would reach out to the current students because they would be in the best possible position to explain and to uh, prepare new students for what is coming, all the excitement, right? Yeah, 
very good uh, point there. We mentioned it also in the presentation that it's uh, possible to chat with students who come from a variety of different backgrounds uh, to to get an understanding of student life. Igor, you have, I have one point. thing I could yeah. Uh, mentioning the uh, the website is great, uh, Unibody System. We also have a virtual tour actually at the school. You can honestly manage a really nice tour that you can take. Uh, we follow some students through all of the locales that we have. That, that's really good to do. Mm. Okay, uh, Madeline, would you like to weigh in? What, what, what would you tell a young prospective? Well, you don't have to be young, I suppose, but <laughs> a prospective student who 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 looks up information on our website? They find your program and that yes, that that's the one for me. What aside from that, uh, what what do you want to tell prospective students? I think the the most important points have basically already been raised. When I started working with the program two years ago, we had a lot of issues with students kind of leaving the program because it was not what they expected it to be. And since then, we have really worked with our information that we provide uh, to prospective students. So we really work on our web page to make sure that all the information you need is there. And as, our, as has already been mentioned, it's really useful, I think, to go through to look at the program structure, to look at the course syllabi, to see what you will actually study. Because I think, as, as was mentioned before, sometimes people just see, aha, this sounds, this name sounds super interesting, but actually they want, for example, sometimes our students say, ah, but why don't we have language courses? And well, I mean, I can understand that point, but the program structure that we have is what we have. And I think it's important to know that already when, when you apply what you can expect. From, from the program. And I think also, uh, as Igor said, really like keep an open mind. I think specifically for international students, the first few weeks or maybe even months will be hard because there's so many new things. It will be a new system of studying. It will be a new system of how you know, the studies are structured and how to interact with your teachers, with your classmates. It's a new country, a new city. There's so many things to, to get used to, but at the same time, your studies start basically right away and you're expected to perform at 100%. <laughs> of course, you're not expected to be an expert when you start, but you're expected to, to start. There is not, it's not like a high school course where you do something for several weeks. Here, sometimes one course is just a few weeks. So it's really, really intense. But my advice would be to not give up. It gets better for sure. And just it takes some time to get used to, but it will 100% be worth it. And I think Lund is a, is a great city to do that, especially now, um, hopefully post COVID, let's say, yeah. um, where you really have this um, great atmosphere between students. There are so many activities you can do outside of your studies as well to, to get to know the new country, to get to know the new city and to, to get to know new people, which is of course also a very important aspect. A lot of great advice there, I would say. And speaking of managing expectations, uh, the, the people watching us today are, of course, not even admitted students yet, but applicants, uh, most of them, or thinking about applying anyway. And we have a question about this uh, for you, Igor, in the Q&A. Um, approximately how many applicants are there for international, uh, for bachelors of international business? And can, uh, can the applicants ho uh, hope to get a seat? <laughs> Uh, quite a lot of applicants, and since we have two rounds, so we have an international admissions round and a national admissions round, I think last year we had a little bit more than 3,000 applicants in all, so quite evenly distributed between the two rounds. Yeah, and can you uh, repeat also how many seats there are on the program for those who didn't uh, eight, Usually we have 80, might be 70 to 80 per yeah. year, so out so, of those 3,000, it's 70 to 80 students who are admitted. So pretty tough, uh, tough to get into international business. So we want to just throw that out there as well for those who are eager. That doesn't. We don't want to discourage anyone to apply, of course, <laughs> but uh, manage expectations again. Um, we're almost getting to the end of the webinar, but I want to get back just briefly. We were talking a little bit about jobs and we were giving more general advice and ideas of what you might be uh, working uh, as after uh, you graduate from one of these programs. But I want to ask, because this is a question we get so often, do you have any practical tips for your students who come in and come from another country far away, they come to, to Sweden, they don't really know how things work here. Uh, they really want to study hard, but then they want to get a job, whether it's in Sweden or, or abroad. 
what what advice do you do you give to students? When should they start looking? How should they look for work? And and generally, how should they behave to increase their chances to to get a job after graduation? Uh, let's start with Yako. Well, I think that's the most important piece of advice I would have is for students to first find out where their heart is at, what they are interested in before they dive into something. Um, and in that respect, I think that all of the programs we are discussing here today provide students with the opportunity to, to find out what they are good at, what they are interested in. You can do an internship to get a bit of an impression of what you like or might dislike. You do an internship and then the question is, can you see yourself doing this for the next 10 years or so? So, yeah, I mean, you, you have to learn from your studies at university, but most importantly, you also have to look into the mirror once in a while and, and, and ask yourself, okay, I'm developing myself, who, who am I and where could I end up? And then start with a bit of a strategy. It's a strategy that, that quite often would involve applying for a master program. Um, if not, yeah, then I think that an internship or foreign uh, exchange stay um, might might provide you with, with further opportunities to, to get to know yourself a little bit more. So that is what I would recommend. Great advice from Jaco. What do you say, Igor? What's your practical advice for students who, who uh, to start their career after the program? Yeah. I would like to start off with the same same perspective as Yako mentioned, actually, the, the application, to be honest with yourself. Uh, why are you applying to a program? Uh, what is it that you like about it? What, what would you like to get out of it? And what would you like to work with eventually? And when you apply to the programs, try to focus at why would you yourself like to apply? So sometimes students apply for some programs or courses because family member might recommend it. So they want to do what to appease the family members or friends, for example. And I think that at, at a young age, when you're coming out of upper secondary school, it's really important to be honest with yourself and to focus on yourself because it's you who are going to continue with this and do the actual studies and eventual work. Uh, and once you've done that and pick the program that you're interested in, uh, yeah, in general, internships are a really good idea to establish contacts. And what we recommend, we also have quite a lot of business fairs. So it's good to uh, interact with prospective companies, for example. Uh, we have the uh, student union who interact and arrange these fairs, for example, in the beginning of spring. In general, we have a fair here uh, at the School of Economics and Management. So just interact, network, and during your studies as well, you will find yourself and what you're interested in. And once you do that, it will be much easier to contact companies and to speak honestly and with interest and to find internships. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Madeline, what advice do you give students about their future job seeking and their careers? I think so many great points have already been raised, so I will not repeat that. I will say from a little bit of a different perspective, uh, an advice that I quite often give to my students is if you find a job that you're interested in, have a look at the requirements. What does it say in this job ad that you found and how can you reach that point? Because a lot of people are kind of scared by, oh, I have to have all these degrees. I have to just study for 10 years and I have to do this and this. Sometimes it's not that difficult. And sometimes it, it can also be a good idea actually to contact that organization or whatever and see, okay, who are you looking for in, to fill this role? What candidate would be ideal for you? What kind of skills do I need to come with if I want to work with you? And quite often people are super helpful and they will tell you a lot of things, even if you are not qualified right now, that is also a way to network as was mentioned before. So there's so many ways to go about that. But I think really what, what Igor and Yako said that it's, it's so important to find out what you actually want to do. And um, because if you find something that you're passionate about, it will be so much easier to, to work towards that goal. For sure, for sure. So much great advice. Johan, I think it's time to wrap up. Yes, it's, uh, I'm looking at the, the clock. It just, uh, it just turned to 4, 4 p.m. in the afternoon here in Central European time. Uh, Central European winter time might even add, uh, and we're going to get ready to wrap this session up. Uh, I would like to 
thank our panelists, Madeleine, Igor, and Yaku for, for being here today and answering questions about their programs. And hopefully we are able to provide some information or have been able to provide some information to prospective students who are wondering what these programs are about and what I can become and what I can do. Uh, so thank you all panelists for joining. Uh, have a great weekend, all of you. <laughs> and Maria, uh, thank you as well uh, for this session here today. Yeah, and we've posted some uh, links here again in the chat, if you missed those before, um, to where you can reach us and where you can see other events coming up and also where you can chat with our current students. So if you still have questions, we won't leave you hanging. There are plenty of ways to reach us later on as well. So thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.